Hey guys, welcome to a Alt Shift X live stream to talk about Dune. Uh, we've just released a whole lot of Dune content. Uh, there's a big 85 minute long video called The Real Dune, which is comparing the 2021 Dune movie to the first Dune book. Um, there's also a podcast chat conversation with Quinn from Quinn's Ideas, the YouTube channel. Um, so if you haven't seen those, there are links in the video description to go and watch that video, to go and subscribe to the podcast. Um, so always after videos, especially such ridiculous, huge videos as this one, there's a lot of bits and pieces, lots of little bits of information and details that didn't make it into the final video. Because believe it or not, not every detail was included. It took a lot of editing uh, to choose the most important uh, details to include in the real June video. And there's lots of other bits and pieces that I, I would still love to talk about. So in this stream, I'm going to talk about some of that stuff, some of the details, some of the ideas that I think are really cool. Uh, that weren't mentioned in that video. So this live stream, I want to focus on uh, the first half of the first book uh, and the Dune movie. So I don't think we're going to talk about any spoilery stuff. I don't think we're going to spoil the next Dune movie or the later books. Uh, I will warn you if we're going to drop any spoilers. But I think at least to start, we're going to focus on the, mu the movie and the first half of the first book because there is plenty to talk about just uh, in that um, just in that first half of the first book and the movie. Uh, so yeah, uh, links in the description if you haven't seen that stuff, and I'll answer any questions that you guys are dropping in the live chat. And uh, yeah, what do you want to talk about, guys? Thanks for the super chat from Matthew Smith, who says, "I love the video and I love you." Oh. Thank you, Matthew. Love you too. All right. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was Earth. Because Dune is set thousands of years in the future. We don't know exactly how many thousands of years. I mean, it tells us that Dune is set in the year 10,191. Um, but that's not AD. That is uh, AG, which means after Guild. So Dune is set 10,000 years after the formation of the Spacing Guild, who were the spooky space people who control space. Um, and we don't actually know how long after today the Spacing Guild was formed. I mean, I'm talking about the canon of Frank's books here, by the way. Um, so, and, and, we, and, and like space travel is mentioned as having taken place for like 10,000 years before the Spacing Guild formed, I think. So, so my point is that it's like at least 20,000 years in the future. So Earth in this far distant future is now a mystery. It's like a f mostly forgotten memory in Dune. They, they mention how like the upheaval of the Butlerian Jihad, which is when they broke all the computers and the robots, the, the chaos and the upheaval of the Butlerian Jihad destroyed a bunch of historical information about Earth. And so throughout the Dune books, and I again, I'm not spoiling stuff, throughout the Dune books, there are these little references, these little bits and pieces, th these little memories of Earth that are still remembered. Um, they mention, they mention uh, France, because uh, the word melange, like spice is also called melange, and melange is like a French word. And so, you know, the historians in Dune say that, oh, we think that the word melange comes from some ancient Terran place called Franz, and it's spelt all funny. So there's like a vague, well, there was once something called France, but they don't really know what it is. And there is a character um, in the later books who recalls London and Mozart and Bach, uh, but but he's one of the few who's aware of this stuff. So I, I really enjoy how Earth is this long forgotten memory um, because that fits with the themes of Dune being about change. Nothing like stays the same forever. Um, and the fact that Earth is like irrelevant in the universe of Dune 
uh, I think fits that theme really nicely. They do also talk about how there are life forms from Earth that are now on Arrakis, like the kangaroo mouse, um, and like the desert hawks, and the date palms, and the barrel cactus. Uh, and in the Dune book, they talk about how, huh, like, we're pretty sure these animals are from Earth, and we don't really know how or why there are these Earth creatures living on Arrakis, but but here they are. So, you know, I mean, I guess obviously, like, Frank just wanted to include real animals so that we, you know, know what they are. But, um, you know, I, I, Earth sort of has a legacy in the universe of Dune, but it's mostly forgotten. I mean, there is, uh, in one of the later books, and again, no big spoilers, I'm not going to drop any big spoilers, but there is a character um, in one of the later books who talks about the the great conquests of a king of Assyria by the name of uh, Asher Nazirpal, Asher Nazirpal II, who was apparently a real king of Assyria who conquered all of these places, and the character describes the conquests of Ermia Lake and Comagen and Kabur and Tyre, Sidon, Gebel, and Israel and Damascus and Edom, and this king conquered all of these places. And then the character says, so this amazing king who took over all these places, does anyone remember these names and places? Can you even name the planet where this person came from? And so the point is that it's like that poem Ozymandias. The point is that no matter how great and powerful you are, your conquests are swept away by time. Nothing lasts forever. No dynasty lasts forever. No plan or ideology lasts forever. And all of our petty human ideas and our petty human egos are nothing before the constant change and flux that is the universe. That's one of the themes of Dune. And I think it's captured really well by the sort of obscurity of Earth. So yeah, they, they sort of continue to mention bits and pieces from Earth throughout the series, but it's, it's mostly just a relic of interest to few, and um, I enjoy that very much. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Asael, who says, a Big fan, was wondering, would an ice cream brand on Arrakis be called the Bene and Jerriot? This wasn't a pun. Look, there's potential there. You should uh, send a letter to the Ben and Jerry's Corporation to get a get a brand deal happening. Thanks for the super chat from Aslan, who says, "How would they end the movies or any other series when the book is unfinished?" Feels like another Game of Thrones moment. That's a good question. So, the Dune series, like A Song of Ice and Fire, isn't finished. Frank Herbert died before he wrote all the books that he wanted to write. Uh, he wrote, Frank Herbert wrote six Dune books, um, and his son and another author wrote a bunch of prequels and sequels, but a lot of Dune fans don't consider those books by his son to be canon. Frank himself never got to finish his series himself. Um, and so, you, yeah, it's right to be concerned that how are they going to finish this story? But the thing is that, uh, I mean, full disclosure, I haven't read the last two Dune books yet, but... The Dune series does have a nice, neat-ish story in the first three books, or the first four books, really. Um, Dune was originally written, the first three books were originally written as one story. Dune, Dune Messiah, and Children of Dune. And that is one arc that does tie up a lot of the plot lines and the characters and the themes. After Frank wrote the first three Dune books, he believed he was done, and he wasn't going to write any more Dune books. So, the third Dune book is an ending. You, you could totally read just the first three Dune books and stop there, and you would have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. Um, the fourth Dune book uh, sort of continues on and, and adds some more, and then the fifth and sixth, uh, you know, the story continues. Um, but you totally could do an adaptation that stops at the end of book three, and that, and that has been done. There was a miniseries... Uh, that started in 2000 that adapted the first Dune book and the second and the third and stopped there. And I think that works. Um, so I wouldn't worry about them like running out of story. And like, like I mean, that look, they're not going to make big budget movies of the later Dune books anyway. Uh, I won't spoil anything, but the later Dune books get very, very weird. And I don't think they would make great Hollywood action movies. 
uh, without spoiling anything, like book four, for example, involves a lot of talking and not a lot of action. I mean, if you think Dune was kind of slow uh, it, and like conceptually, like like the sci-fi and the themes, like the Dune books get weirder with every book. And, and, and I love them for it. And I recommend that you all go and read these books. But with, with the current Dune movies, like Denis Villeneuve has talked about well, you know, we're going to do Dune Part 2 to finish the first Dune book, and hopefully we will get another movie to adapt Dune Messiah, which is the second book. But Denis Villeneuve is not even talking about adapting the third book, let alone the fourth or the fifth or the sixth book. Um, I don't think it would be a good idea to try to make the fourth and fifth books into Hollywood movies. I, I, it, It's just too weird. Maybe like a animated miniseries would be cool or something, but... Yeah, so uh, the Dune books aren't finished, but like I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Just read the books if you're interested. Honestly, uh, Quibbles says, uh, "Have you read the Brian Herbert books? Love all your videos." I, I have not read the Brian Herbert books. I, I, I mean, I've read some of them, and um, I have not felt the need to read a whole lot more. There's plenty to talk about in Frank Herbert's books, so that's what I'm focusing on, um, and. Maybe I'll take more of a look at the Frank Herbert books later. I mean, I have been looking at um, s some of the imagery in the real Dune video uh, came from the graphic novel adaptation of um, Dune House Atreides, which is one of the uh, prequel stories written by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So, um, uh, you know, I, I have paid attention to some of what's going on there and uh, you can go check out that graphic novel if you're interested. Thanks for the super chat from Nicholas, who says, can you elaborate on what exactly Leto was trying to stop from happening? Do the books give more on, more information on what he sees? So that's a question about book four. Um, we're not going to talk about the later books just yet. Um, later on, how about later on, I'll give a big spoiler warning and we can talk about some of that stuff. But for now, we're going to focus on the first book and the movie that just came out. Um... I mean, short answer, without spoiling anything, it 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 stays ambiguous. Um, like we know we know the basics of what was going on there in book four, but like a, a lot in Dune is left ambiguous and unexplained. Um, and Frank Herbert was very deliberate about that. I mean, Frank Herbert talked about how he wants to spark people's imagination. He doesn't want to explain every little thing. So, if, you know, if you're coming into June expecting clear answers on everything, you're going to be disappointed. The, the, the purpose of the story is not to present, here's an answer to every single question. The purpose is to uh, present you with questions uh, that tickle your brain. And I think Frank does a great job of that. Um, but yeah, I'll, we, we can do some spoilery stuff a bit later on. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Cal Jager, and thanks for the super chat from Zach, who says, been following you since the Game of Thrones videos for years. Your content is unmatched. Love it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Zach. So another thing that I want to talk about, just a little thing, um, is that we mentioned in the video that Dune is a bit like Game of Thrones in space, because there's a lot of obvious uh, similarities between Dune and Game of Thrones, like they both have these noble families who work under an emperor or a king and they're all fighting and they're constantly murdering each other and plotting and assassinating and fighting for control of land and there's this medieval feudal class system, um, lots of similarities. And, and one of the really cute similarities that I enjoy is that... Um, the Emperor Shaddam the Fourth comes from House Carino, and the Carino throne is the Lion Throne. They don't really talk much about the heraldry in Dune, but the Carino symbol is a lion, and the Atreides symbol is a hawk, and the Harkonnen symbol is a is a ram. But they like almost never talk about it. <laughs> Frank Herbert is not as interested in the sigils and the heraldry and the Lannister lions and the Stark wolves. Frank Herbert is not as interested in that. But but my point is that Shaddam IV's throne, the Emperor of Dune, sits on the Lion Throne. And I just think it's kind of funny and cute that Lion Throne sounds, a, sounds an awful lot like Iron Throne. Lion Throne, Iron Throne, like in Game of Thrones. Um, probably a coincidence. 
But but something that we didn't talk about in the video is that Dune has had a massive influence on science fiction. Like, the science fiction of the last 60 years has been massively influenced by um, Dune. And you can see that in Star Wars. Like, Frank Herbert complained about how much Star Wars was similar to Dune. Uh, you can see that in Warhammer 40,000, 40k, um, in terms of, like, lots of elements. But... Yeah, I, I enjoy that little thing. But but in, in terms of, like, you know, like, the concept of a god emperor is something that comes up, and that's in, like, Warhammer 40k, and the idea of, like, a sort of a low-tech sci-fi, or, like, a, even just, like, a low-tech aesthetic that you see in, like, Star Wars, to some extent, uh, you can see borrowed from Dune. It's, it's hard to overstate the significance and the influence of Dune. Anyway, uh, Smith Black, uh, thanks for the super chat, and Smith just says, Beef Swelling. Uh, so you might have seen the meme of, like, the the beef swelling in the loins. Um, th this is sort of an infamous line in Dune uh, that comes from a sex scene. Uh, quote, There was an adult beef swelling in his loins, and he felt his mouth open, holding, clinging to the girder shape of ecstasy. Then a sigh, a lingering ground-swelling sweetness, a collapse. <laughs> That's that's the description of a uh, orgasm in the third Dune book. A, a an adult beef swelling in his loins. Uh, yeah, the sex scenes are not the best part of Dune. Um, thanks for the super chat from Braun, who says like movie and you talking about it, but the start of the first book was hard to get past for me. Do you think it's worth to keep trying to get over the hump? Yeah, the the first. Chapter of Dune is tricky, because they throw a lot of jargon at you, like Gomjabar and Kwisatz Haderach, and, um, and they actually comment on that within the chapter. Uh, where are my notes? Uh, there totally is a moment where they're like, yeah, Paul thinks, ooh, the strange words, what's a Gomjabar? There are so many things to learn. And, and then in uh, the second chapter of Dune, uh, the Harkonnens are talking and, and the Baron's like, St stop saying all this nonsense. You're saying all this nonsense just to confuse this other character. Like, th that is a theme in Dune, is that words and language can be confusing and overwhelming. And and Frank Herbert does deliberately do that. He confuses us and overwhelms us uh, as a way to sort of test and challenge and provoke us to sort of figure out what's going on. Dune is like a puzzle sometimes for the characters and for the reader. Um, to answer your question... Dune doesn't get easier. Like, it's not like once you get past the difficult beginning, Dune is just easy to understand and easy to read, and it's all smooth sailing from then on. I would say that Dune gets more and more dense and weird and complicated as you go on. Like, at least within the series. Like, each Dune book gets more weird and more difficult than the previous book. Um, I mean, maybe within the first Dune book itself, um, you know, maybe if you get past the first chapter, it gets a little easier, but... Uh, Dune has plenty of weird stuff in it. It's easy to be confused. I mean, it's a good thing that there's that giant Alt Shift X video to help help guide you through it, uh, and I and I hope that we'll make an Alt Shift X video to explain the second half of the Dune book and other Dune books as well at some point. But um, yeah, I would not say that the Dune book gets easier. Thanks for the donation from Ranark, who says I've seen some criticism of the most recent movie as a white savior narrative. What are your thoughts on this? I feel like the movie makes it pretty clear what Paul is doing isn't necessarily good. Yeah, um, th the answer to that question is if you read the rest of the story, if you read June Book 2 and June Book 3, uh, you will find that uh, Paul's not a saviour. I mean, I, I, I won't spoil it, um, but the point of June is to question and complicate the whole, the whole idea of a savior. Um, it's, it's not a white savior story. I mean, it's also not about, like, like it doesn't say that Paul is white. I mean, I mean it's, this is not, like, a super interesting thing to talk about, I guess. But the, the Dune movie depicted, like, everyone who's not from Arrakis as being white and, like, that contrasts with the skin color of the people who are on Arrakis. 
But I find it interesting that, like, in the third Dune book, um, like, it mentions that a character has a saturnine face, which is, like, an old school word for meaning dark skin. Uh, and it also says that that person looks like the Emperor, Shaddam IV. Uh, it also just, and, and, you know, the first Dune book describes Leto uh, as having olive skin, um, and Paul looks like Leto. Uh, my point being that if you're assuming that all of the Atreides and the Emperor are white people, um, that's not really what the book says. And if you're assuming that all of the Fremen and all of the people in Arrakis have dark skin, that's also not really what the book says. The book generally does describe the Fremen and the people of Arrakis as having dark skin, but but not all. Like, there's also, like, blonde Fremen. And, and Chaney. Chaney is a redhead. Chaney is a ginger in the books. So... So, you know, to answer your question, like, point one, uh, if you read the following Dune books, you'll learn that this is not a simple story about saviors. In fact, the entire point of Dune, or probably, you know, the main thematic interest of Dune is to question and undermine the idea of heroes and saviors and, and you know, everyone blindly following a leader. The point of Dune is to question that. So, in that sense, it's not about a white savior. And part two, it's... It's not even really clear if the Atreides are white, uh, nor is it always the case that the people who are following him have dark skin. So, I mean, Frank Herbert doesn't describe his characters all that much because Frank Herbert isn't really interested. Like, race is not something that Frank is really that interested in writing about. Um, and so he doesn't describe, like, people's skin color all the time or indeed their hair color or anything about them. So... I mean, this is something that I talked about with Quinn. Um, so if you go and listen to the podcast uh, linked in the description, um, me and Quinn spoke about this in some more detail about whether Dune is a white savior story. Uh, and my short answer is, if you read the full story, the answer is no, it's not. Thanks for the super chat from David, who says, I was disappointed that the movie didn't make the Baron the active schemer that he is in the book. In fact, they actively say he didn't sabotage the Atreides. Thoughts? Um, I don't... I'm, I don't... Rem, I don't... Rec, I don't know what you're talking about with they They actively say he didn't sabotage the Atreides. I'm not sure which what you're referring to with that. Um, but you're right that they definitely made a lot of changes to the Baron. Um... So the Baron in the movie is very understated compared to in the book. Um, the Baron is this lurking figure who exists in the folk, and he's very sinister and he's very quiet. He has this very quiet intelligence, this quiet strength, this quiet menace. He doesn't say much. Um, he just sort of lurks in the shadows. Whereas in the book and in the other adaptations, uh, the Baron is a cackling maniac. I think this gives you a pretty good idea, this shot from the 84 movie. Uh, the, the Baron in the books, uh, he does these monologues. He's flamboyant. He's loud. He's over the top. And he's constantly uh, going on and on about how smart he is and all of his plans. He... he, he rants about this is this is from the 2000 miniseries the baron is constantly going on about how magnificent he is and how intelligent how clever his plans are and ooh, those atreides are really gonna suffer um and denny villain you've talked about changing that because he found the the baron in that depiction to just be kind of ridiculous and it's hard to disagree looking at the uh, bright red harkonnen nappy here um and instead, uh, Denny chose to make him more of a, a subtle baron. And I can, I can understand that. Like, I, th I think that it does work better. I, I think that the bright red nappy does not work as quite a, much of a compelling villain as the sinister baron. But you're right in that there is something lost there. Because in the book, we get to see more of the baron talking about his plans. And you're right, we do get a, more of a sense of him, him being a... Um, active participant in what's going on and more direct. And, that, and that's something that I want to talk about, actually. Um, because in the book, in these scenes where we, where we get to see the Baron plotting and scheming, uh, like in This Art by Rostislav Zagornov, um, one of the things I really enjoyed was their discussion of the hunter-seeker that they send to kill Paul. 
Um, so you remember in the movie and in the book, this little device uh, gets sent to kill Paul. This little flying needle comes to uh, strike his heart. And I, I like the context that we get behind that in the book. Because in the book, uh, the Baron and Piter are discussing, yeah, like we sent this hunter seeker to kill Paul. A- and they say that, um, that, that they say that this hunter seeker was not in the book. It's not that's not the only uh, attempt that they make to kill Paul. They actually send like that. They fill Paul's bedroom with like one hundred different death traps, uh, and most of those death traps were decoy death traps that they intended for Thufia to find and to disarm. While the hunter seeker was the one real trap that was more deeply hidden that they really did intend to kill Paul with. So there's like this multiple layered thing. But there is another layer to that, which is that Vladimir says that, well, he actually kind of doesn't care if the Hunter Seeker kills Paul, because even the Hunter Seeker is a diversion. So it's like a diversion within a diversion, because their real plan is with the traitor Yui. Um, So I enjoy how, you know, that's one of the details that we get. And, And I mean, you know, we talk about in the real June video, we talk about how um, the Baron constantly talking and indulging his ego and indulging his just love for talking all the time. Um, that, that, that's part of his like indulgence and his weakness. And, and it's, it's like the, it's part of his failure to control himself is the way that he speaks. I mean, there's a moment where he's talking to the beast Raban and Vladimir explains part of his plan to Raban. And then in his head, the Baron is like, wait, wh- why did I tell that to Raban? Like, I, 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 I shouldn't trust him with that information. Like, it was a bad idea for me to tell Raban that. So even the Baron is aware that his constant talking and bragging is bad for his survival. It's not smart for him to be rabbiting on like that, but he does. And so, um, so I agree with you, David, that like, you know, there is something lost in that they in how they changed the baron um because the baron's indulgent rambling persona is part of how he embodies the evil and the weakness that june is trying to criticize you must control yourself and the baron talking is part of that but also like there's the fact that they had to cut something you know like they're fitting this enormous complicated book into one movie they had to cut a lot and making the baron less talkative (laughs) that is one way of um of removing uh too much material um thanks for the super chat uh and, and by the way, it is uh, if you do want to give a super chat to ask a question or whatever, it is better to use the uh, donation link in the description, the Streamlabs donation button uh, at the top of the video description on YouTube. If you use that link, uh, YouTube doesn't take half the uh, donation. When you use super chat, YouTube takes a chunk, but if you use that link in the description, they don't, so it is better. But whatever. Thank, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Barnell, who says, Have you read the Saxon tales from Barno- Bernard Cornwell uh, or The Last Kingdom? Uh, no, I haven't. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Loki. Uh, Kel Jager asks, Have you read Red Rising by Pierce Brown? I, I haven't, but, well, I've read a bit of it um, because that's about the colonization of Mars and all like years later on Mars, there's a civilization of humans on Mars. And, um, I did read like the first chapter or whatever that describes a hanging on Mars and it was incredibly dark and disturbing. Um, it said, and I don't think this is a spoiler. I think this is the, like the first chapter of red rising, uh, by Pierce Brown, but it said that it said that they, they hanged a man and, in this brutal, horrible society, they force the family members, when someone's being hanged, they make the family members pull on the hanged man's legs so that the noose tightens and kills them faster, because on Mars, it's only got like a third of the gravity of Earth. Um, So you you can't hang someone in the usual way on Mars with with the less gravity, so they make the family members do it. (laughs) It's just this horrifying, striking way to start a goddamn sci-fi series. So, so yeah, I have read a bit of Red Rising, and, and I would like to read more. I could totally imagine Red Rising being adapted into, like, an awesome TV show or something from the little I know. Um, but, yeah, it looks like a cool series. Um, 
Thanks for the super chat from Gotham, who says Paul is Azora. Hi. There are certainly similarities. I mean, it is funny how in Dune, the messianic uh, chosen one is called the Kwisatz Haderach, or the Lisan al Gaib, or the Mahdi, depending on who you ask. And in Game of Thrones, um, the chosen one is called Azora High, or the prince that was promised, depending on who you ask. Um, and Azora High is. Ah, uh, what's it called again? The it, Azorahai is taken from a Zoroastrian messiah called Azura Mazda. Is is that correct? Uh, Ahura Mazda. Yeah, that uh, Ahura Mazda is is a real religious figure in the Zoroastrian religion. It, yeah, the creator deity in Zoroastrianism um, is called Ahura Mazda. And I think Ahura Mazda is where George Martin got Azora High. Um, both George and Frank take real sort of history and mythology and sort of twist it and uh, scrub off the serial numbers and use it in their own stories. Uh, and so Azora High comes from Ahura Mazda. Uh, Kwisatz Haderach in Dune comes from uh, Hebrew mythology or like a, a, a Jewish mythology. Which I think is also Kwisatz Haderach or something very similar, which which, which in uh, Hebrew mythology it refers to it refers to um, oh fuck it, it, it's like it's miraculous transportation. It's traveling from one place to the other by leaping across a large distance. Oh, what there's a beautiful term for it. Uh, it is. I should remember this. What's the term? What's the phrase that they use? Yeah, the shortening of the way. Or contracting the path. It's like bringing together the two distant places so that you can instantly cross them. Um, that's what Kwisatz Haderach means in in Jewish sources. And that's what uh, Frank adapted for Dune. And, and, and that idea of... Uh, shortening of the way that also kind of evokes the idea of fold space the idea of instantly traveling across space uh when you think about it which is another thing that i want to talk about <laughs> what a segue um because in dune we in the real dune video we, we talk about how space flight in the new movie these giant ships called hayliners or highliners are like these tunnels they're like these the, these tunnel shaped objects and it seems that ships fly through them uh, to reach a distant place, because you can see there's another planet through the Halena ship. So it seems to be like a wormhole through space, uh, so that you can instantly travel from one galaxy to the other. Um, and that is an idea that is talked about in the later Dune books, the idea of folding space and instantly traveling. And that is an idea that comes up in the David Lynch Dune movie from the 80s, there is a very fun and ridiculous scene where the uh, spacing guild navigator folds space and it's this whole dramatic thing. But in the first three, in the first four Dune books, there is no mention of fold space. There is no mention of instantly traveling through space. In fact, uh, it's pretty clearly described as traveling through space, like, like not instantaneously, but it takes time to fly. I mean, it's faster than light, I suppose. But it still takes time to travel. It's not instant fold space technology in the first four books. Um, so it's interesting that they brought that idea into this movie. And I think it works. I think it looks great. And, and you know, Denny Villeneuve talked about trying to evoke a mystical, a sense of mysticism with the space travel and with the technology. And I think that works really nicely. Um Thanks for the super chat from Raphael, who says, Do you think George Martin watched the Dune movie? If so, do you think he wishes Denny Villeneuve makes in a Song of Ice and Fire movie? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that there are, there are people saying, Ooh, they should remake Game of Thrones season eight, since it was so bad. They should do like a movie to remake it or something. Um, I don't know, Denny Villeneuve doing a Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, Denny Villeneuve is so good at science fiction with like Arrival and Blade Runner 20, 20, 20 something. Um, would Denny Villeneuve do like a medieval fantasy like Game of Thrones? I mean, maybe. I, I, I don't know if that would fit his style. Um, I, I mean, Denny Villeneuve is quite minimal 
in some ways. I mean, especially in Dune, like stylistically, um, and even in terms of like you know the the, the direction and the dialogue and everything's kind of understated in Dune. Whereas A Song of Ice and Fire, I would like to see A Song of Ice and Fire being more lavish visually and and in terms of the production and 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 in terms of the detail and the richness and the sets and everything like one of my complaints with the game of thrones tv show is that they took away a lot of the bright colorful costumes and the armor and the the hair and the speeches and the food and the animals and the armies and the castles everything's big and bright and bold and the banners and the wind uh, that's part of the point of the A Song of Ice and Fire books is to really revel in the fun of that fantasy at the same time as like thematically George undercuts and questions and subverts the assumptions of that genre and of that fantasy. Um, it's meaningful that A Song of Ice and Fire really relishes the the genre and the, and the senses and the experience of the genre at the same time that it subverts it. Um, what's my point? My point is that if I did see, like, a Game of Thrones movie or something, uh, by a different creator, like, I would want to see more, um, visual, uh, intensity, if anything. Anyway. Uh, thanks for the super chat from David, who says, The carry-all failed in the film, but the pilot was bribed in the book. Uh, yes. Uh, so in the movie, uh, we had this carry all thing which which it's cool that all right so, so like these are the spice harvester machines uh that are used for extracting spice from the sands uh so that it can be processed and sold uh and spice harvesting always summons a worm because of the vibrations and the worm attacks it so people spice miners use a carry all to carry the spice harvester to safety before it gets eaten which is an incredibly dangerous uh, job, isn't it? Uh, just putting yourself in the way of a giant destructive sandworm. Uh, you know, how was work, honey? Well, didn't get eaten today. Um, but the carryall that carries the harvester to safety is in the book described as just a big ornithopter is how it's described. And it doesn't really go into any more detail than that, as far as I remember. Um, whereas in the new movie, they, they chose to make the carryall not just into a bigger version of an ornithopter, but it, it, it has this big inflatable hot air balloon thing, uh, in this concept art by Steve Berg and this giant balloon inflates and then flies the harvester to safety, which looks great. And it sort of looks like it could work, you know? Whereas if they got another one of these spindly bloody ornithopters with the little metal wings, it, w- it would be hard to believe that spindly little ornithopter carrying an entire harvester, right? So I, I think this design of this carryall is a really elegant and appropriate change. Um, and-, and that, you know, like I, I-, I talked about this with Quinn in-, in the podcast, which is linked in the description. I, I think they made really smart changes, you know? Like the-, 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 the Denny Villeneuve 2021 Dune movie is mostly very faithful to the books, and I think most of the changes they made were really smart and good changes, and yeah, I like how they changed the carryall, but anyway, as you say, David, um, yeah, so in the movie, we see how the carryall just breaks in the movie, because, uh, all the gear is, like, badly maintained, and the Harkonnens have just left behind all the broken shit, uh, to sabotage the Atreides, Whereas in the book, the, the Harkonnens actually specifically, like, got some of their agents to, like, take over the carryall and fly it away to screw over the Atreides. Um, which, the more I think about it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, because how could the Harkonnens have known... Oh, I guess the Harkonnens would have had a spy that would have let them know that um, Leto and the Atreides were visiting that particular harvester. I don't know. It's, it's a very minor change. Uh, thanks for the donation from Chester Tester, who says... I've never understood how houses have tried for generations to break the imperial conditioning of Sook doctors, and in the end, all it took was just to threaten their family. Are you seriously telling me no one ever tried that before, or ever consider, or even considered it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so Doctor Yui is a Sook doctor with imperial conditioning, and what that means is that he's been conditioned, or you know, I suppose brainwashed is probably a better word. Uh, to never uh, kill a human being, which is like, you know, 
the Hippocratic Oath, basically. Um, it's also mentioned in later books the idea that like they can't even turn against their masters in any way. The, the point is that he's because of his conditioning, it's meant to be impossible for him to be a traitor. But the Harkonnens break his conditioning uh, by torturing his wife, Wanna, and the torment of seeing his wife tortured... Um, is enough to break his conditioning, and so he works with the Harkonnens. And yeah, like, you're right, Chester, you would think that someone would have tried that by now. Uh, I mean, I guess, like, there th- there aren't all that many Sook doctors around. Um, like, it's probably only the really rich noble families who can do it. Um, maybe, you know, Yui was a particularly vulnerable person. Um, maybe his love for his wife w- was so unique. Because, yeah, this is really special. Because, like, the Baron talks about how, hey, like, we can't let anyone find out that I broke Imperial conditioning, because that is a really big deal. Um, and so in the book, the Baron actually specifically tells the Emperor, oh, hey, by the way, it's not, I, I didn't break Imperial conditioning. No, no, it's impossible to break Imperial conditioning. It just turns out that Yui was not a real Sook Doctor. He didn't have the real Imperial conditioning. He was a fake Sook Doctor. Um, so, so the Baron wants the Emperor to think that Imperial conditioning is, it, it does always work and there's no way to break it, I suppose, so that the Baron can use this secret knowledge that it is possible to break the conditioning to his advantage. So, yeah, I mean, that is an issue that's discussed, Chester, in, in the books. Um, and, I, yeah, I guess that I, I guess no one has... I, I, mean, he, I mean, here's another possible answer. The, the Harkonnens are notably um, innovative in the field of torture, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, so, like, Peter de Vries, we, we, as we say in the Real Dune video, he, he is a twisted mentat. Um, Mentats are not meant to be as fucked up as he is. Um, he has all of these evil desires. He likes to torture, uh, people. Like, in the book, the, Piter, when he's standing over Leto, like, there's a scene in the book where the Baron has found out that Paul and Jessica have escaped, and so the Harkonnens threaten to torture Leto to find out where Paul and Jessica went. I mean, Leto doesn't even know, so it's pointless. But, like, there's this really gross stuff where Piter is like, oh, you know, if I dripped, like, boiling wax on you until you burned, the lacerations and the lesions on your skin would be so delightfully glorious or something really gross like that. Um, And there, there also is this idea, and this is... Not a spoiler? I don't think this is a spoiler. It's... All right. It's in the appendix. This is maybe a tiny, tiny spoiler. But, um... Piter invented something called residual poison. And the idea of residual poison is that you put the poison in someone's body. And the chemical is such that it doesn't kill the person instantly. uh, Because you give the person an antidote. Um... And so, as long as you keep giving the person the antidote, the residual poison won't kill them. But, as if that person ever leaves your control, or if you ever just choose to stop giving the person the antidote, the person dies. The, the person needs the constant antidote being given to them to survive. That's what a residual poison is. And the appendix mentions that, like, yeah, Piter, Piter invented the residual poison. And in all the talk about the torture and stuff, like, Piter, Piter is way too into torture. My point is that Piter, like, Piter is so fucked up and so smart that he invents whole new kinds of torture and killing that no one has thought of before. He is an innovator in the field of murder. Um, so my point is that maybe, uh, you know, Piter and the Baron are so depraved and so horrible and so evil that they came up with kinds of torture and ways to manipulate and fuck with Yui that were so horrible um, that they were the first to ever ever break Imperial conditioning. They made Yui suffer more than any Sook Doctor ever had before. I think that's a very plausible explanation for how they broke the conditioning. And, and I mean, we talk in the Real Tune video about this uh, spider monster that's in the movie. And this spider is not in the book, but there is a theory going around that what if this spider is Dr. Yui's wife, Wana, and they took her apart and put her back together again into this monster as part of their torture. Um, and so I think that's 
you know, a cool idea, if not something that's in the books. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Silver, who says, Sorry, but I must point out that you pronounced Yui's name wrongly. It's not Yui. It would be Yue. Think yeah, but with a U. Yeah, um, I, I pronounce things wrong. Everyone pronounces some things wrong. Um, Frank Herbert didn't worry about fr- pronunciation too much. Um, I don't either. Y- y- you know that George Martin, the author of Game of Thrones, you know how he pronounces Dothraki? He pronounces it Dothraki. George Martin says Dothraki. And look, it's a matter of taste. I prefer to say Dothraki. We're allowed to say things differently. Everyone speaks things differently. Although, tell you what, I will admit that my pronunciation of Dune... I can understand if that aggravates you, because <laughs> I know that most people say Dune. I, I I tend to say Dune. Most people say Dune, Dune, Dune. And you know, I I, I respect that. I probably should say Dune. Um, and the reason for that is that the author of Dune, Frank Herbert, he said that part of why he named his book Dune is that Dune sounds like Doom, as in you know disaster, Doom. Uh, and it does take on a wonderful, ominous undertone when you say it like that. So, yeah, I should say Dune. Yui, Yue, Yui, Yue. Meh. Eh. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, Sean in the live chat says, George isn't a real fan. Yeah, he George doesn't know how to pronounce his own characters. He doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, yeah, look, we should put, we should put umlauts in it. Uh, Smash Davo in the live chat says, it's like Harkonnen versus Harkonnen. Yeah, I know what you mean. And Atreides versus At- Atreides. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's another thing. Um, Frank Herbert says Atreides. Atreides. It's like four syllables as opposed to Atreides, you know? Um, so, look, I-, I play it fast and loose with pronunciation. I, you know, whatever. Uh, I think I, I think it's not the most interesting part of the story, and Frank Herbert said as much as well. Anyway, uh, thanks for the donation from Leo, who says, Is this Dune related in any way to the movie Dunk <laughs> that released a while ago? <laughs> I think there are some interesting similarities. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I know what you're saying, Leo, um, because in the... Uh, posters and in the uh, advertisements for this new Dune movie. Uh, Have I got a poster that I can pull up? I'm sure I do. Um, The sort of stylized lettering that they used uh, to advertise this new movie. Uh, It's... They've changed the letters into this, like, the D, the U, the N, and the E are reached these sort of curves. Um, And... The unfortunate thing about that pattern is that the letter E has a line through the middle, which breaks the pattern. So they sort of awkwardly remove the the line in the middle of E and replace it with this sort of burst of light, which kind of works. But like, if you sort of squint your eyes, <laughs> it does look like it says dunk. <laughs> I thought you were talking about dunk and egg for a moment there. But um, yeah, look, it's 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 a bit tortured graphic design wise uh it, it's a cool idea it, they they did their best with it but maybe they just should have written their letters normally you know <laughs> yeah thanks for the super chat from jess who says hey asx now that the expanse show is done for now will you do videos on the rest of the books i got into the show from your videos thanks for all the great videos you share Yeah, so we made a bunch of videos about The Expanse, which is a sci-fi series by James S.A. Corey, who, by the way, uh, James S.A. Corey is a pen name for Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, who, by the way, uh, worked with George Martin. Uh, Ty Frank was George Martin's, like, personal assistant for years, and Daniel Abraham uh, wrote the graphic novel adaptations of of A Song of Ice and Fire, working with George, and they're, like, friends of George in New Mexico. I mean, this is just uh, this is just gossip that you might find interesting because I do. Um, what's my point? My point is that the Expanse is a really cool series. Um, I like it, um, and so that's why we made a bunch of videos about it. And the Expanse TV show covered the first six books, but it did not continue to cover the last three books. It's a nine book series. Um, and I'm sorry if this horrifies you, but but James S A Corey, Dan and Ty wrote all nine Expanse books in between when George Martin wrote the last A Song of Ice and Fire book and now. Like, 
let me rephrase that. The nine Expanse books were written in the same time it's taken George to write zero books. <laughs> in, in the time we've been waiting since the last Game of Thrones book, A Dance of the Dragons, George has written zero books, whereas Daniel and Ty have written an entire nine book science fiction epic. <laughs> I mean, all right, strictly that's not true. I, I think maybe A Dance of Dragons might have come out after the first Expanse book. And also George did release The World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood and whatever. But still, that is like, my God. The, the, James S.A. Corey sure can write. Um, but yeah, I like The Expanse a lot. And uh, you can go and watch, I think there's like nine Alt Shift X Expanse videos. Um, I, I, I like that series a lot, and I hope that one day there is a screen adaptation of the last three books, because the last three books of The Expanse are some of my favourite books in The Expanse. I mean, more, more eight and nine. Like, I think my favourite Expanse books are, like, five and eight and nine, which is hard to- <laughs> which is a hard sell. <laughs> like, if you're trying to convince someone, hey, you should totally read this nine-book ex- uh, science fiction series, it gets really good around book five. <laughs> Kind of a hard sell. Um, and each of them are quite long. Anyway, this is, this is not an Expanse live stream, so we're not going to talk about it here. But, but you're very well... Uh, to answer your question, Jess, um, I don't... I'm not planning to make an Expanse video about the last three books anytime soon, but I would like to at some point. I, I'm not in any rush, but yeah, I, I, it would be cool to do a video about the last three Expanse books, because I'm sure there are lots of people who followed the show and are curious about the next three books, and who knows if they'll ever be adapted, so maybe someday. Maybe someday. Thanks for the super chat from Sir Laszlo, who says, Why did the Harkonnens try to assassinate Paul? Good question. Um, because, yeah, we were talking before about, you know, they had this plot with the hunter-seeker. Uh, to assassinate Paul, which is that, like, flying assassination device that comes and tries to stick Paul with the pointy end. Um, it's meant to actually, like, go inside your body and, like, churn, chew through the arteries and find a vital organ, which is a horrifying detail. Um, and as I said earlier, the Harkonnens mostly did the Hunter Seeker as a distraction. Um, I mean, you get the sense that they did it that they tried to kill Paul more because, like, the Atreides would be suspicious if they didn't try to kill the Atreides, you know? Um, because Vladimir, the, the Baron, uh, when he talks about this plot, he says that, oh, I kind of hope they don't kill Paul um, because the Baron is sexually attracted to Paul in the books because the Baron has sex with boys and, and rapes uh, young boys in the book. Um, and so the Baron's like, oh, I don't really want to kill Paul. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway because we need to, like, keep the Atreides on edge and distract them from our real attack, which is the traitor Yui, or Yue. Um, so, th- 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 it's a multi-pronged attack. Like, in Dune, they're always talking about this idea of, like, distracting you with something so that you can kill with the real threat. So, like, in shield fighting... Uh, like, you know, when, when Gurney and, and Paul are attacking, that's something that they added in the in the movie, actually, where where Paul thinks he's defeated Gurney and he holds the knife to his throat. But then Gurney's like, oh, by the way, I've got you too. I've got a blade at your heart. Um, so there's the idea of, like, distraction. I mean, they talk about one of the common strategies uh, in shield fighting in Dune is to use a slip tip which is like the secret blade in the, in the in the left hand. So you like you do a feint and a and a fake attack with your right hand so that you can distract the opponent and then sneak the real blade, the slip tip to kill them uh with the with the blade sinister in the hand sinister. Um so it's this constant idea of like you distract your opponent with a with a feint or a distraction and then you go in for the real kill. And masterfully like that that motif, that idea fits with one of the central themes in Dune, which is about you have to control your mind. And so, like, you know, part of why the Harkonnens are are the ultimate bad guys in Dune is because the Harkonnens are 
indulgent and they fail to control their minds. Like we talked about that in the real Dune video. The Baron constantly eats. The Baron constantly indulges his evil sexual desires. The Baron constantly talks. The Baron's hands are constantly moving compulsively. He can't control himself. He can't control his mind. And, and that makes him distractible. When you are distractible, when you fail to focus on the right things, you get killed by the blade, by the hunter seeker. It, it, it's all about, and, and that relates to language as well. Like, like Dune talks about how language can be used to confuse and distract people and to mislead them, which can make them vulnerable to attack. So uh, the answer to your question, Laszlo, is that the hunter seeker attack was a distraction to make the Atreides more vulnerable to the real attack, which was Yui um, and the, you know, Sardaukar. Um, and that fits with the theme of, like, controlling your mind lest you be distracted and killed. Um, and, and while we're talking about Gurney, by the way, so, like, this scene where Gurney fights Paul, they train, um, is similar to how it is in the book. But one of the differences is that in the book, like, Gurney fights Paul so hard that for a moment Paul is like, oh my god, is Gurney trying to kill me for real? Um... That's how hard Gurney fights Paul in this training scene in the book. And then we, he realizes that, oh, no, you know, Gurney's just really pushing me. He's not really trying to kill me. Um, but Gurney's kind of making a point here, you know? Like, he's fighting so hard to show Paul, hey, you have to be ready. This is serious. Like, this is not about training anymore. This is not about games. This is life or death. Arrakis is serious. Arrakis is real danger. Uh, we know that the Harkonnens and the Emperor are out to get us, so we need to be at our absolute best. So it's about, like, growing up. Um, and, you know, Gurney does have a lot more going on in the book, and some of that might happen in the next movie. But, I mean, you know, Gurney's personality, he, he, he is this minstrel, uh, this singer, this poet. He's quoting scripture all the time. There's a little bit of that in the movie, but I don't know. It, it, he has a lot more in the book that is fun. Like he he sings a song in the Ornithopter about he he is a desert owl and he sees across the desert and it's just like cute and fun. And he and he, and he sings like these dirty songs. And Paul is like, you better not let my mum hear you singing those songs about how hot those women are on that one planet. Like, he's just, like, got a lot of personality in the book, which is really fun. And I think it's a shame that that wasn't included in the movie. Uh, thanks for the super chat from MLG Bear Fighter. Thanks for the donation from Goblins Are Real, who says, I really wasn't a fan of the way Duncan Idaho was portrayed. I really think the actor is not a talented actor and shouldn't be given a speaking role with such weight. What were your thoughts? Um, I think that Duncan in this movie worked, played by Jason Momoa. I, I think that he... I think that he's right for the role. Um, but something that... <laughs> go and listen to the podcast with Quinn that's linked in the description if you would like some more discussion of that because I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> but in terms of uh, Duncan and Jason Momoa and the acting performance, uh, go and listen to the podcast linked in the description if you want more on that particular topic. But overall, yeah, I, I think it works because Duncan is meant to be a powerful warrior. He's meant to be really hot. He's meant to be just this cool dude. And I, I, I think that is what Momoa did, and I think that it worked. I mean, you know, there is more going on uh, in the book, of course, with, you know, like, Duncan gets drunk at some point, and it is a shame that we never get to see Duncan get... We don't get to see Jason Momoa get white girl wasted in the Dune movie. That would have been fun. And, you know, there was also an, an opening scene uh, originally in the movie where Duncan, like, lands on Arrakis alone, and that was going to be the opening, but it changed. But, um... I, I, I was happy with Momoa's performance. I thought some of the fight choreography was a bit lacking uh, with some of Duncan's fights, but yeah, whatever. I enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for the super chat from uh, Schwabi. Sir Pounce, Lisan Al Gaib theories, please. I, Sir Pounce is definitely the Kwisatz Haderach. Thanks for the super chat from Chris, who says, Have you seen Severance? Lots of fun theories there to discuss. I have seen Severance, which is a new TV show. Uh, it's on Apple, and it is a workplace science fiction horror comedy, <laughs> is how I would describe it. 
I won't discuss it in detail on this June live stream, but I did enjoy it. And one of the interesting details is that Christopher Walken is in Severance, the actor, and he has been cast to play the Emperor of the Universe, Shaddam IV, in the next June movie. And I think that is great. And I talk about that with Quinn in the podcast episode linked in the description. Thanks for the donation from Andrew, who says, Sorry if this has been asked already, but what was your favourite scene in the movie versus the book, and vice versa? Loved the newest video. Really enjoy these deep dive videos. What was my favourite scene from the new movie that wasn't in the book? That's a great question, and I'm sure I'll be able to think of a good answer if I think about it. Um, I mean, something that we talk about in the video is that... um, the Atreides are more sort of a normal family in the movie compared to the books. Like in the books, they're more sort of formal and military and Paul calls calls Leto Sir more often. Um, they're more sort of emotionally distant. Uh, whereas I, I quite liked that in the movie they have this breakfast scene with, with Paul and Jessica. I- insert um, Walt Jr. Breaking Bad meme here, I suppose. But but seeing Paul and Jessica have breakfast is just like a simple thing that makes them feel like a normal family. Like they're just relaxed. They're just in a space that's just domestic and normal and routine. And we don't see that in the book. In fact, in the book, the, 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 Leto, there's sort of a weird moment where Leto mentions, oh, you know, by the way, Jessica, like, I will allow you to have dinner on your own in your bedroom instead of in the dining hall because I won't force you to have dinner with me uh, in like a formal context or something. And it's just kind of this weird moment in the book where it's like, oh, that's that's kind of a weird and emotionally distant thing to say later. <laughs> like, like, like when we first see Jessica and Leto together in the book, it sort of feels like they don't like each other very much. But then later it's like, oh no, they really love each other. And it's like, okay, like Leto and Jessica do love each other. But like, there's a lot of time when they seem very sort of stiff and formal and not emotional with all the Atreides throughout the book. So so I think having this breakfast scene was really cool. Um, I mean, another scene they added to the movie was this scene where like the Emperor's spaceship arrives and, you know, we see the Atreides and we see the Herald of the Emperor and we see the Space and Guild and we see the Bene Gesserit. That's not in the book, but but it makes sense for the movie because you want like a visual representation of like, what is this universe? How does this politics work? Like who who's who? Who's the Bene Gesserit? Who's the Space and Guild? It makes sense to add that. Um, so, yeah, I think that made sense. Um, I mean, the graveyard scene as well was, was not in the book, um, where Leto and Paul visit the, the cemetery of the Atreides and they look at the gravestone of the old Duke. Um, apparently in the Art and Soul of Dune, it's mentioned that when they were making the movie, they originally planned to have Leto and Paul swim to this cemetery on like an island. So they'd have to swim through the water to get there. And there was this like concept art for it, which I think is a cool idea um, because, you know, one of the things they do is they show all of the water on Caladan, which contrasts with the dry deserts of Arrakis. And I, I, I think showing the Atreides swimming on Caladan would have really driven that point home really well, seeing the abundance of water so much you can swim in it. Whereas on Dune, there isn't, you can't drown because there's no water on Arrakis. No one swims on Arrakis. So that would have been cool. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess I liked this, this scene, like, you know, it creates this emotional connection between Paul and Leto, so his death is more sad. Um, so yeah, I, I, I liked that. Um, I, I'm just like looking through the movie to see which scenes they added. Um, I mean, this is something that I wanted to talk about anyway, was like, like Gaius and Jessica, so, so like Gaius Mahayam, she's, she's the witch, the Bene Gesserit witch who visits the Atreides, and Gaius Mahayam is... A really cool character. Again, I, I won't give any spoilers, but like Gaius, Gaius is relevant later on in the story in ways which are really cool. And but one of the things like in this scene in in the book is that you know like like the scene is about how Jessica feels loyal to her family and she's like you know chosen to have a son Paul instead of a daughter. She, Jessica has gone against the Bene Gesserit's orders. Um, whereas Gaius is more committed to the Bene Gesserit and she's saying like, we've got to do this Kwisatz Haderach thing. Like we've, you've sort of fucked everything up, but we've got to make do and we've got to salvage it. And hopefully we can make this ancient breeding plan work still. Um, 
And and so, you know, the, it shows us this tension with Jessica. Jessica's intention between love and duty, like in Game of Thrones, between the Atreides and the Bene Gesserit plan. Um, but in the book, they have that same tension with Gaius as well. In the book, uh, Gaius cries at the end of this scene as she's walking out. Um, and Gaius says that, like, she's sorry that she can't help Jessica more because like Gaius is like a mother to Jessica. Jessica doesn't know her mother. Jessica doesn't know her father because she's a Bene Gesserit um, and they take people away from their parents and she doesn't know what her history is. Um, and so Gaius is like the closest thing that Jessica has to a mother. And so Gaius is being a hard ass and saying like, you got to get, a, got to get in line. Like, like Gaius says that Jessica was an idiot for falling in love with Leto because the Bene Gesserit aren't meant to love like that. The Bene the, well, yeah, the Bene Gesserit aren't meant to love. They're, they're meant to be above that. They're meant to be in control of their emotions and they're meant to use their partners for political reasons. Like the Bene, the Bene Gesserit are these great manipulators. They are these controllers and they're not meant to have real feelings for their husbands. Um, so that's the, that's the fascinating tension with the Bene Gesserit. And, but Gaius also shows some real emotion in the book. Gaius says, quote, Jessica, girl, I wish I could stand in your place and take your sufferings, but each of us must make her own path. I cannot let that interfere with duty. And Gaius lets out a tear in the book. And Jessica sees this tear and she's like, fuck. <laughs> like, like seeing... The Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mahayam, this tough, hard as nails, psychic mega witch, <laughs> seeing her cry and show vulnerability and uncertainty is like earth shaking for Jessica, and it's really powerful. Um, so I think it's kind of a shame that that wasn't included. Um, and there are some people in the live chat talking about. Gaius and Jessica, and there are things that, there are things in later books, but, you know, we're not spoiling things here. Um, oh, are we just going to go through every scene? I mean, what else was added? It was fun to see uh, Paul looking out over the sunset on Caladan, which is just like that shot in A New Hope, Star Wars, when Luke Skywalker is looking out at the double sunset. It's the hero before they set off on their journey. They're looking out at the world, looking out at the horizon before they strike off into the distance. Um, th I mean, this scene where the Atreides walk out onto Arrakis uh, and the people are shouting, Lisan al-Gaib, that, that wasn't in the book. Um, it's just mentioned in one of the, like, quotes that, like, oh, by the way, some people think that Paul is Jesus, uh, but it's not actually shown in the book. It's just mentioned, and, and that's true of so much of the Dune book. There's so much stuff, including, like, really important moments in the book um, that are just, oh, yeah, I mean, that happened, by the way, and then they talk about it after the fact. There's very little action in the book, so it makes sense that they um, add a lot of these scenes to make it visual. Um, they added this, like, gardener talking about the date palms in the movie, which I, I, I didn't like because they took away the idea that the people of Arrakis are resentful of these date palms because they waste water. Uh, but whatever. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't know. I liked a lot of the stuff that they added. Um, some of it not as much. I mean, they added the stuff on Seleucus Secundus with the Sardaukar, um, which was, you know, cool to actually see them before they turn up. I think that worked. I mean, they added this battle scene. Uh, where the Sardaukar and the Harkonnens attack and the Atreides fight back. There's no battle scene like that in the book. Um, and I think that it could be accused of being a bit silly, <laughs> this scene in the movie. Like, just seeing a lot of these dudes walk around with machetes, because that's how you fight in the in the future. I mean, maybe part of the reason why Frank Herbert didn't include a lot of action scenes is that it does feel kind of silly for dudes to be fighting with knives in the high-tech future, but, you know, that's the reality of the world with shields. Anyway, thanks for the super chat from Mark, who says, uh, Battlefield Earth on April Fool's Day. Would you make an April Fool's video about it? Maybe. Uh, Mark says that would love your take on Love, Death, Robots. Yeah, I just watched Love, Death, Robots season three. Uh, I thought there were some cool bits. Uh, yeah, that is something we could maybe make videos about. Thanks for the super chat from Loki, who says an animated A Song of Ice and Fire show would be awesome. I agree, that could be really cool. Uh, thanks for the donation from Lena, who says, what's your opinion on Jarodovsky's Dune? 
Um, so, yeah. So as you say, like there were a lot of uh, big people involved in Jurodovsky's Dune. This this was an adaptation of uh, Dune into a movie that was attempted in like the well, was it the seventies? Uh, and it never happened because Jurodovsky, who is this mad Spanish genius, um, basically wrote a script that was like ten hours long and would have cost. Um, a, a, an appreciable percentage of the GDP of a respectable country. Um, and so the movie was never made. But but he got a bunch of, like, all the coolest artists of the time were on board. H.R. Giger, who did the uh, concept art for Alien, he created the xenomorphs and the whole aesthetic of Alien. H.R. Giger was on board for this Dune movie. Uh, Salvador Dali who I didn't even realize was, like, alive in the, in the same era as these guys. Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones was set to play Fade Routher Harkonnen. Um, Orson Welles. Uh, like, the, there's a crazy list of, like, the badass people who were set to be involved in this giant Dune movie. And um, it never happened. Salvador Dali was going to be the emperor, and he claimed that he wanted to be the highest paid actor. He, he asked for $100,000 per hour to act in the movie, and Jarodovsky accepted. <laughs> so, look, it, it's kind of ridiculous. I don't know if this movie ever could have happened, um, but it is a great story, and there is a documentary, a 2013 documentary about Jarodovsky's Dune that I, that I recommend. It's a really cool documentary about this movie that never happened. And, um... It's very cool. Uh, thanks for the donation from someone who says, why do you call Piter, Piter, and... Ch ch All right, okay. We're, we're talking more about pronunciation. Um, so you could say Piter Peter, I guess. Like Piter DeVries, Piter Peter. Um, and Chaney, you could say Charney. Uh, as I said, I, I, I don't know. I don't really care about pronunciation. Like, I'm happy to imitate the author's pronunciation when possible, but, like, I, I don't know, I don't think it's a big deal. Paita just seems right to me. Chaney, Charney, uh, whatever. Uh, there's no particular reason. Um, thanks for the super chat from Deontay, who says, I'm watching your Real June video, just found your channel, you have a new subscriber, keep up the hard work. Thank you, Deontay. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Tech, who says, as a fellow editor with a much, much smaller channel, I admire your unique style. Do you do your own editing? Uh, mostly, yeah. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Smith, who says, Would you rather have the powers of a reverend mother or the powers of a mentat? Ooh, interesting question. Um, I mean, honestly, like, the, the specific powers of the different people are not always super defined, and sometimes they're not all that differentiated. I mean, like, the, the Mentats are said to have great powers of logic and processing data and computations and calculating probabilities, and that's used in, like, military tactics and in, like, finance and, and, like, political battles and, like, money, and, like, they figure out all the details. I mean, Thufir is also, like, a spy master and an assassin master, and so he's, like, a political strategic powerhouse who figures everything out. I mean, of course, part of the point of Dune is that Thufir fails, Thufir fails to anticipate the Harkonnen attack properly. He fails to protect the Atreides. So, you know, like, Mentats might not be all they're cracked up to be, is part of the point of, of Dune Book 1. Um, and the point of that is that, you know, maybe our logic and our beliefs and our assumptions, uh, maybe they're not as smart as we think they are, and we've got to watch out for our limitations. Uh, but, you know, Dune also talks about, you know, there is value in thinking in terms of flow and process and generalities. Um, uh, so what's my point? My point is that Mentats are definitely powerful and smart, sure. Uh, Reverend Mothers, their powers are a little bit more mysterious, um, without giving stuff away, um, but they can see into their ancestral memories, uh, so they, like, have all the memories of, uh, their female ancestors, they have all the, the memories of their mother and their mother's mother and so on, all the way back to the goddamn single cellular organisms, I think. Um, and they also have the memories of the reverend mothers who participated in their ritual. That'll, that'll be explained later. Um, reverend mothers can control their own bodies, their muscles, their nerves, their reproductive systems. 
um, their internal biochemistry. Like they can swallow poison and then change the chemistry of the poison within their body, within their body, so they're immune to the poison. They have like amazing memories. They can like perceive people's um, body language and their emotions from, from like they, they can read people's emotions from their bodies. Um, they have that they can fight in the weirding way. They are incredible. They they are incredibly badass. Um, and yeah, like the the main thing that differentiates a Reverend Mother is that they have that ancestral memory. That's what makes them sort of more than the Bene Gesserit. But they're also generally the most wise of the Bene Gesserit. Um, I think the Reverend Mothers are more badass. I mean, of course, like the, there's no such thing as a male Reverend Mother except for the Kwisatz Haderach. Like the Reverend Mothers are all female. Um, and they can only look into their female memories, but the Kwisatz Haderach will look into all their memories of all their ancestors, and it's that wisdom and that knowledge that makes them so much more powerful, as well as having, like, extra prescient sight. Um, so yeah, I, I think the Reverend Mother is more powerful, um, and, you know, if you're a male Reverend Mother, I guess you're the Kwisatz Haderach, so that's pretty cool. Uh, Deccan in the live chat says, what is the weirding way? So, <laughs> so... The Bene Gesserit are trained in combat. Bene Gesserit can fight really well. And we see that in the new movie uh, when Jessica beats up Stilgar. And that also, I think, was kind of lame fight choreography, to be honest. Um, but Jessica t- beats up Stilgar, and and that is a demonstration of the fighting prowess of the Bene Gesserit. And in the book, the Fremen call the Bene Gesserit fighting style the weirding way. And like weirding j- is a term used in some cultures for magic, right? Like weirding is is witchcraft. Um, so when the Fremen call it the weirding way, I think that's just their general term for their interpretation of what Jessica is doing. In the 1984 David Lynch movie, they they kind of changed it. Um, they made the weirding way into like a thing that was about projecting your voice into a weapon. Like it shoots your voice as like a ray gun and you've got to get a, a physical device called a weirding module that allows other people to use the weirding way to like blast people with ray guns. <laughs> um, which is very different to the book. Um the point is that the Weirding Way is just a term that the Fremen use to describe the Bene Gesserit's badass fighting style. That's 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 all the Weirding Way is. The David Lynch movie made it into ray guns <laughs> for some reason. Uh, but yeah, that's all it is. Thanks for the donation from Smashed Avo, who says, Hey Shift, love ya. What's your overall opinion on the David Lynch adaptation? Good segue, Smashed Avo. I know it's kind of a meme film, but I've always loved how it has more of the LSD wackiness of the book, even though it makes no sense. Uh, I agree with you, Smash Davo. Like, the David Lynch movie is ridiculous in so many ways. Um, I, can, I mean, I can pull up some shots of some of the more ridiculous things in the Lynch movie. I mean, for one thing, uh, there's a bunch of pugs everywhere. <laughs> Like, this is Leto and Paul and Jessica. There's just an Atreides family pug for some reason, and they take it with them on the spaceship. And, and I mean, the Lynch movie, like, it's funny, like, Denny Villeneuve wanted to keep the spaceships mysterious and subtle, but, like, <laughs> in the opposite way, the David Lynch movie, uh, it takes you inside the spaceship, and we get, like, this full-on video of... of and now we will fold space, and, and the navigator's like, "Look, pee wee wee wee," when there's these lasers, and and it, it it is not uh subtle. It is not, but 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 it is, as you say, Avo. It's very trippy. It's very whoa. What's even going on, man? Like the visuals lean into that in a way that does suit the sort of trippy vibe of Dune. Uh, the, the like the minimalism of Denis Villeneuve's Dune d- does not capture the whoa wackiness of of the Lynch the Lynch film, which is something that is there in the book. There's another pug. We have Patrick Stewart playing Gurney Halleck, carrying his battle pug into the fight against the Harkonnens, I suppose. And I mean, you know, as we said, like the Baron in the Lynch movie uh, is is a cackling maniac flying around on his suspenses like a lunatic, uh, which I think was overdone. And like, there is this character, Fade Rautha, who will appear in the next June movie, who's played by Sting and who wears a tiny metal codpiece <laughs> and nothing else. 
Um, and yeah, there's there's all manner of wackiness that happens in the Lynch movie. And I do love it for its wackiness. And I think that the wackiness is to some extent, um, that does capture something that is there in Dune. Um, but for me, like in terms of actually capturing the story and the meaning of Dune, I think the, the Lynch movie fails in a lot of important ways, which we can talk about um, in a in another time uh, because it's a bit spoilery, like the ending of the Dune movie. I mean, there's also this uh, Raban has this like lunchbox that has like a little rat inside the juice box and then he crushes the juice box and drinks its blood like there's so much fucking bizarre stuff like that there are these kids who have i mean look you can go you can watch this movie yourself and make your own opinion but um look there there's things that i like about the david lynch dune movie but i I would say that overall it's kind of a garbage fire I, i love it but it's kind of a garbage fire and it's certainly not a faithful adaptation of dune Thanks for the donation from uh, Kermes, who says, The Dune story suffers a bit from exotic, mysterious woman and magical Negro tropes. They are somewhat present in the books, but I thought the movie doubled down on these tropes with the slow-mo visions and memories. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I I, I talked a bit before about um, the depiction of, like, race in Dune, and I think that the movie... The movie sort of leaned into this idea that the all the Imperial people and the Atreides and the Harkonnens, they're all white. Like, I thought it was really weird that the Sardaukar are all white in the movie. Um, but the Sardaukar come from a prison planet which takes, quote, the worst riffraff in the galaxy. Like, the the Sardaukar and Seleucus Secundus are explicitly, like, people from all over the universe, so why do they all look the same, you know? Um, so my point is that, like, the, the whole sort of, at least, you know, People's skin tone and race is not as cleanly divided between, you know, all of these white imperial oppressors and all of these darker skinned Fremen people. That's something that the movie, I think, leans into more than the book ever did. Um, But, you know, there absolutely is like Orientalism and exoticism in Dune um, and, you know... I, I don't know. I'm not really qualified to talk about this stuff all that much, but like, you know, it does lean into the idea of like, yeah, the the magical tribal primitive, quote unquote, you know, um, that is a thing in the Dune book and in the Dune movie. And, and the Dune movie tried to sort of like take away the specifically like Arabic and Islamic influences that Frank Herbert was partly drawing from, um, which I think is a shame that it sort of like tried to hide what the influences were, you know, because the influences are still there. It's just not as visible in the New Dune movie. So, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, like, I, I agree that there absolutely are, like, exoticism and orientalism and, like, weird race stuff. Like, that absolutely is there in the original Dune book and in the new movie, I think. Um, and the movie, I, I think, does kind of it, it tries to avoid it, but it kind of makes it worse. There's a guy called, um, oh, what's his name? There's a guy who wrote about this and who can talk about this stuff better than I can. Uh, Harris Durrani. If, if you go and look up the essays by Harris Durrani on Medium, um, he writes a lot about this stuff um, better than I can. So you might want to go read from him. Thanks for the super chat from Silver, who says, sorry, uh, yeah, we answered that. Thanks for the super chat from Ashish, who says, what do you think about making the first book as a trilogy itself? The book has three books, which follow three act structures. Movie ending felt abrupt. Yeah, so Dune was originally written, like the first three books in the Dune series were originally written as one story. Um, And the new Dune movie stops halfway through the first book in the trilogy. Uh, which is kind of like if you made a Lord of the Rings movie that stopped halfway through the Fellowship of the Ring. It is abrupt. Like, it's like they get to Amon Hen and then they stop. It's like, what? We haven't done anything yet. Um, I guess they kind of framed it around, like, you know, the fall of the Atreides after the Harkonnen attack. But, like, it absolutely is an abrupt ending. And I think it would be better if it didn't end like that. I think it would be better if they either did it as a TV miniseries 
or maybe even if they broke the first Dune book into three movies or something, like, that they're, they're trying to force a structure onto the story that it was not designed for. Um, I, I think trying to put the entire Dune first book into one movie is kind of insane, um, and that's part of why the Lynch movie was not a very good adaptation. Um, I, I agree that it ends very abruptly halfway through. And, and I feel like, I feel like, why not just do like a, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It is abrupt. It wasn't designed to be in a movie like this. I, I think a, a TV miniseries structurally makes more sense to me than a movie series. Um, that or just read the books, you know? Uh, thanks to Ilyas. Thanks to Mark, who says... Oh, yeah, we did that. Thanks to Bob, who says, I love your All Tomorrow's video, and found it interesting that Dune shares some overarching ideas with that work, like the Space Navigators of the Guild. Are there more examples of that in Dune? I mean, All Tomorrow's involves a lot of, like, genetic manipulations, and sort of the the body horror, the grotesque body horror of manipulating uh, humanity and manipulating biology. And that is something that the Tleilaxu do in the books. I mean, we saw that weird Harkonnen spider in the movie, which is reminiscent of some stuff that the Tleilaxu do. And I won't spoil anything, but, like, there are uh, axolotl tanks and uh, biological manipulations that happen later on that are horrifying in a similar way to how All Tomorrow's is horrifying. Um, and, yeah, in terms of, like, the rise and fall of empires, like, All Tomorrow's is about... I, I mean... Uh, in the interview that I did of the author of All Tomorrow's, C.M. Kozeman, which you can listen to on the Alt Shift X podcast, which is linked in the video description, uh, Memo said that All Tomorrow's was partly inspired by the uh, decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbons, which is a famous history book about the Roman Empire. And... Memo said that All Tomorrow's was partly inspired by this sort of big, broad timescale of looking over the rise and fall of empires. And that that's something that Dune does as well. And I, I think, I, I, I haven't, I'm not certain, I don't think there's, I don't think there's proof that Frank Herbert ever said this, but I think that uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was an influence on Frank Herbert as well. I mean, it's an influence on a lot of people. Um because Frank Herbert is definitely interested in that idea of, like, rising and falling empires. I mean, something that we... Something else I wanted to talk about was the idea of, like, um, decadence and stagnation and decline being, like, part of what's happening in the Imperium. Um, like, that's something that the Lynch movie did capture really well, was this, like, crazy golden art deco design in the emperor's um in the emperor's court in the david lynch movie it captures the luxury and the opulence and the wealth and that that and that in frank herbert's mind is connected to like moral degradation like if you're spending all your your focus and attention on superficial wealth and indulgence and luxury and pleasure you're not focusing on what matters and you're not preparing yourself for danger and for change and so like this this opulence and this decadence is is implied to be part of what causes the downfall of the empire. I mean, and, and that, you know, that includes the Sardaukar. We were talking about them before. Um, and the Sardaukar, it's mentioned in the Appendix of Dune uh, that the emperor had been spending less money on training the Sardaukar. And as a result, the Sardaukar have become cynical and corrupt and less effective. The Sardaukar have a reputation as like the best fighters in the universe, but because the Emperor has been spending less money on training them, they're not as good as they used to be. And so, you know, I think that ties into this idea of, like, decadence and opulence leading to the downfall of the Great Empire. And that's something that, uh, I haven't read the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but my understanding is that that's one of the ideas that comes up in that history book, is the idea that Rome fell because of decadence and opulence and moral decline. And that's sort of how a lot of people interpret it, you know, like the idea that indulging yourself is like immoral and that leads to your downfall, which is kind of a religious idea, like religious judgment, you know, disaster being visited upon you for your moral crimes. Uh, that's an idea that sort of floats through um, a lot of people's heads. And I think that is something that's in June. And I think that is something that um, even All Tomorrow's plays with. 
Thanks for the super chat from Jack, who says, June would have worked better as a TV series. I just said that, Jack. You copying me? Uh, thanks for the super chat from SHO, who says, Paul's abilities get undermined by the fate thing, like in the storm. Um, yeah, so that's something that we talked about in the real June video. Like, I, I think maybe my least favorite um, change that was made from the movie to the book was that when Paul and Jessica were flying in the storm, uh, Paul heard the voices of the Bene Gesserit in his ancestral memory, I suppose. Like, like, like Paul doesn't hear voices in his head like that in the book, but in the movie, Paul hears the voices of, of the Reverend Mothers, and they tell him to uh, relax and let go of the controls. And so Paul lets go of the controls, and he loses consciousness, but still survives. And... Um, I think that's sort of counter to the themes of Dune, because Dune is about, like, going with the flow, or at least adapting to the flow of the universe. Like, you can't control everything in the way that, like, Kynes tried to control the environment. Like, you can't just focus on one set of assumptions, or you can't focus on just one plan. You, have, you do have to adapt to the changing flow of reality. But I think Denny Villeneuve sort of changed that into being not just going with the flow, but, like, having faith in the universe. Um, let go of the controls. Just let it happen, you know? Like, that's, that's not what Dune's about. I mean, losing consciousness like Paul does, that's not what Dune's about. Um, so I sort of disliked that sort of undercurrent of, of, of a sense of, like, faith and letting go of awareness as opposed to embracing awareness and embracing choice. Because Dune is all about individual choice, consciousness, awareness, ag agency, um, which I think Denny Villeneuve sort of undermined a bit. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Harvey, who says, Best scene not in the movie is the dinner scene, where the gang gets drunk and Jessica figures out what's going on. Yeah, well, we talked about that in the Real June video, linked in the description. The dinner scene has a lot of stuff going on. A lot of tension, a lot of sort of mysteries, a lot of moving parts, some of which aren't important at all, but it gives you a sense of tension, which I think is really delicious. Uh, Doverblade says, what are your thoughts on the controversial Alt Shift X video, George R. R. Martin versus Frank Herbert? I try not to watch Alt Shift X videos. I, I saw that the YouTuber Alt Shift X did a live stream comparing George Martin to Frank Herbert, the author of Dune to the author of Game of Thrones, not respectively. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of similarities between those two. Um, I think that it is really interesting to compare them. I mean, I, I talk about this with Quinn in the podcast that's linked in the description. Um, but I think that one, I think that fundamentally one of the most interesting differences is that uh, George, I think, is very interested in just telling a story with Game of Thrones and in, and just enjoying the genre and enjoying the sensations and enjoying the narrative for the for the for its own sake. And he does subvert fantasy tropes a bunch. Um, we'd know more about that if he finished the goddamn series, but, you know, Frank, I think, is more focused on, um, exploring specific ideas. Um, he's more interested in the philosophy and the politics than he is in the characters sometimes. And I think that becomes m more true as the story goes on. So, um, not an easy thing to adapt into a movie. Thanks for the super chat from Joe, who says, how do you think pop? How do you think part one does to set up the theme of not trusting charismatic leaders, making the Atreides more likable? Yeah, so something we talked about in the real Dune video was that the Atreides are dicks. Like, the, the new movie kind of makes the Atreides look like they really are just good guys, but in the book there's a lot of stuff that makes us question whether they really are good people. Um, like, the Atreides do all this sneaky stuff... They use propaganda and they evict families of people who worked for the Harkonnens. And, you know, Frank Herbert has said, like, these guys are arrogant. They are using the people. Um, and so how was that going to lead into sort of the point of Dune? And I won't spoil it, but Dune is about very much about questioning leaders, questioning heroes, questioning messiahs. Maybe it's not such a great idea to have a chosen one after all. Um, and I, I think that the most important thing for that theme at this point in the story is the jihad. Uh, it's Paul's visions of the violent religious crusade um, potentially being waged in his name. Um, and they do make a big point of that in the movie. Um, so 
I think that it's a shame that they lost some of the subtleties um, of the moral ambiguity of the Atreides, because that is getting you thinking about that question. Like, you know, it makes you like the Atreides, and then it shows you that the Atreides do bad things. And so it makes you go, oh, fuck, maybe heroes, maybe charismatic leaders aren't to be trusted. And that is a theme that continues. Um, and, and I think that the, 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 I think that the jihad, uh, the visions of the upcoming potential crusade are um, the most important part of that theme at this point in the story. So I think that works fine. Um, thanks for... Oh, well, and something else that I talked with Quinn in the podcast is that um, Quinn pointed out that Paul makes more of an active choice to stay on Arrakis and join the Fremen at the end of the new Denis Villeneuve movie, which I think is an interesting addition to the movie because it sort of makes it more Paul's choice and Paul's responsibility to join the Fremen, even though he's having all these visions of the potential horrific violent war that could happen if he sort of becomes a leader to the Fremen. So, yeah, I I think that despite the changes, the movie is still doing a pretty good job of exploring the dangers of the messianic leader. So something else I wanted to mention about this, like, jihad shot is that it is happening on Caladan. Um, that's something that wasn't in the book, but, like, when Paul has these visions of the religious crusade being waged in his name... This is this is on Caladan. This is the same place where, like, later when Paul were walking at the graveyard, um, this is Paul's home. And I think it's a really great change because it makes these visions feel more personally relevant and feel more threatening when it's happening in Paul's backyard, you know? Um, you can't be a NIMBY with a jihad. That's what they say. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's a really cool change. Um, the jihad on Caladan makes it feel even more threatening and meaningful. Uh, Thanks for the donation from Leto Atreides Nuts, who says, Banging video, love your stuff. The movie is great, but I think it's a shame that Denny refuses to release any deleted scenes. They filmed the Jessica Yui conversation, Gurney on the Balisset, the ba- there's evidence of the banquet scene being filmed, etc. Yeah, there was also a scene with, like, Jessica and Paul training at fighting that they removed. Uh, look, if they released a Dune super extended mega director's cut Blu-ray with all the deleted scenes in there, I, I would love to check it out. It sure would add some cool footage to future Dune videos. Um, but I also trust that Denis Villeneuve and the people who made this movie know what they're doing. And like sometimes things are cut for good reasons. Um, I think it's good to be selective and to show restraint. Um, so look, yeah, I, I would love to see those deleted scenes one day, but hey, if they decided that they weren't the best scenes to have in the movie, then maybe that was the right choice. Thanks for the super chat from Adam, who says, please do Severance Season 1 analysis videos. I think we won't for now, but maybe we'll do like a Severance Season 1 explained analyzed video before season two comes out because severance is getting a second season so yeah maybe maybe we could do um a severance video before season two comes out uh thanks for the super chat from brinks who says why is the spice never blue so this is something that i talked about with quinn on the podcast episode um some people think spice is brown some people think spice is blue As far as I can tell, by reading the books closely, I think Spice is blue. Um, Because it says it's blue. It says Spice is blue in book four. It says Spice is blue in book three. I think some people think that Spice is brown because uh, Spice is said to smell like cinnamon. And cinnamon is brown. Um, There are also different forms of Spice. Um... You know, there's the spice uh, powder and there's the gas and there's the water of life. And so there are, you know, maybe they are different colors and whatever. Um, But to the best of my knowledge, spice is blue. Uh, It's something that, you know, it, 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 it could be more obvious. Like Frank Herbert doesn't, Frank Herbert doesn't describe stuff very much. He doesn't describe the, the colors and the sounds and the senses very often. So that's why a lot of these things are ambiguous. 
Uh, Frank Herbert just didn't care what color stuff was a lot of the time. It's like, it works. Like, what more do you want to know? Um, and I think that ambiguity is sort of part of why Dune works. Like, th- there is a lot of sci-fi, especially from that era, that is very descriptive of here's the exact shape and here's the exact way that the machine works and here's exactly what it looks like. And it's like, maybe that's cool at the time, but then, like, 50 years later, you're like, well, that sounds dumb that that's not like the technology that is in my world like when you read science fiction that imagines the year 2000 and it describes exactly what all the hovercrafts are going to look like in the year 2000 and you're like eh, that that doesn't look like my world whereas when you write science fiction that's a bit more ambiguous and it it doesn't describe stuff in quite the same ways it, it leaves a bit of room for imagination i think that sort of writing sometimes ages better because when we are in the future uh, we we can sort of, you know, a- adapt to how it's described and we can use our own imagination. And like when we're given room to imagine, it, things feel more relevant, you know? Um, so June describes its technology as the ornithopters look like feathered hawks and the spice harvesters look like giant beetles. L- like that simple evocative description engages the imagination way better than some science fiction that was like, ah, yes, and the 180-foot-long uh, spice device had a had a spice flange at the end of the spice arm that engaged the thruster towards the aft port. Um, it just, yeah, it's kind of stodgy. So, like, I, in some ways I'm frustrated by the lack of description in Dune. In other ways, I like the lack of description because it allows you to use your imagination. Uh, But all that said, I I wish they made the spice blue because the spice makes people's eyes blue. So, of course, the spice is blue. Um, And also, like, spice, like, the color blue in a desert is very magical. It's like water. It's like the sky. It's like, you know, I think this cinnamon color they're using is kind of lame. Anyway, um... Nassau in the live chat says that Jessica is very subdued in the movie. I hope in the next one she's more outspoken. Uh, Something that I've seen a lot of people say is people complaining that, oh, Jessica, Jessica, like, cries too much in Dune. She's, like, super shaking and emotional and, like, she can hardly control herself and, and that sucks is something that I've seen a lot of people say about this movie. Um... And yeah, like Jessica does like struggle with her her emotions a bunch in this movie. But I think that that kind of makes sense when you read the book because, you know, the book doesn't say, the book doesn't describe Jessica crying and breaking down a bunch. But what it does say, like very frequently, like probably like eight times or something in the first June book, it says, oh, and Jessica like was really shocked and afraid. And so she used all her Bene Gesserit training to, to calm her emotions. And Jessica almost cried out and Jessica, whoa, Jessica almost broke down. But then she, she used the litany and she, her calm was restored and she, and she composed herself. So, so Jessica does frequently in the book use her training to sort of manage her emotions uh, that's something that, you know, Paul does as well with the litany of fear. Um, and the only way to show that in a movie is to show emotions on the character's face. Like, the Bene Gesserit are in immaculate control of their faces. And I think that usually, like, I- if you did a straight adaptation of exactly how it's described, Jessica would be, like, stone cold, not a crack, like, not revealing any emotion, um, is how she would actually look in person. But in order in a visual medium to show the internal emotions that Jessica is struggling with, you need to show her crying and sobbing and trembling a bit. So, you know, and, and, and that shows the power of the Bene Gesserit showing that she has that emotion, um, from seeing, you know, Paul in danger from having her, her love later die, showing the intensity of that emotion and then showing how calm she can become that shows the, 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 both her emotional struggle and the power of the Bene Gesserit in controlling that struggle. So I think it does make a lot of sense and it, it does work to have Jessica become very emotional in the movie because um, it shows her training and her power. Thanks for the super chat from Game Inspection who says, how do you feel about the graphic novels of Dune and what's your favorite book in the series? Um, So, yeah, there is a graphic novel adaptation of the first third of the first Dune book, which came out recently with art by 
Raul Allen and Patricia Martin, adapted by Frank Herbert's son, Brian Herbert, along with Kevin J. Anderson. And um, I think it works. I I mean, I think it's better to read the book. (laughs) Um, Like, Dune has a lot of words in it. And it's impossible to fit all of those words in uh, a comic book. They have to take most of the words out. And I think the words are the best bit of the Dune book, personally. Um, So, you know, like, I I think it's cool to put pictures to the words. Um, I think sometimes it adds stuff. But I think mostly you can just read the book, to be honest, or watch the movie. Um, I mean, uh, something that I do kind of like is that they show this giant cube in uh on Gaiety Prime, the Harkonnen planet, uh in the graphic novel, and this is something that is mentioned in later books, is that the uh Harkonnens have a giant cube full of slaves. Uh <laughs> I won't spoil anything, but um yeah, that's just another symbol of how dickish the Harkonnens are. We get to see Gurney with his blonde hair and his big red scar in the graphic novel. Um Get to see the conservatory in all of its glory. Um, I don't have a strong opinion about the graphic novel. They have kinds with the white hair and the blue spice eyes. Um, sandworms have lightning on them for for some good reason, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, the graphic novel's fine. Um, thanks for the super chat from Pyrus, who says, I'd been looking forward to Dune for a while. Are you familiar with the legend of the galactic heroes? I'm not, sorry. They are. And also, um, Game Inspection said, what's your favorite book in the series? I, I, I like Dune Messiah. And I won't spoil anything, but I like the second one, Dune Messiah, because it is thematically very interesting and important. Uh, and it is very weird. Um, and it involves Gaius Mahayim, and it has some weird characters doing some weird shit. And I think that it, it like... I mean, in some ways, I kind of hate Dune Messiah. I I mean, look, I I find all of the Dune books to be challenging and frustrating in some ways, but also very fun and rewarding in other ways. Um, They're not easy reads. They're not fun reads all of the time, but, like, they all have some very cool and thought-provoking stuff in them. And I think book four, God Emperor of Dune, um, encapsulates that a lot as well, because God Emperor is maybe the most sort of slow and dry and frustrating but also cool and weird and thought-provoking at the same time i don't know and children i mean children of dune might be my least favorite one i've I've only finished the first four so far I, i think children of dune might be my least favorite like there's a lot about it that just sort of goes nowhere for me at least um i think i think the first one is not my favorite I think I think my favorites are probably like Messiah and God Emperor, even though those are both also very weird. Uh, God Emperor of Memes says, what are your thoughts on a standalone God Emperor adaptation with no context? <laughs> Just weird dreams, philosophy, and visions. Total alt house weirdness. Denny won't return my voicemails. <laughs> yeah, I mean, God Emperor... I mean, I, I won't spoil stuff, but it is... Um, it involves a lot of lectures from a worm man, and I mean, honestly, like, like God Emperor was written after the first three Dune books, the original Dune trilogy. Uh, Frank Herbert did not intend to write a fourth book after he wrote the third one, but then he decided, ah, you know what, I'll write a book about a worm man. And um, it's cool that, I mean, it's a cool book, but it, um, it, it could exist without context, I think. Like, Kind of. Like, there are some concepts that would need to be explained, but I think a lot of the story, like, the story is separated from um, the original Dune trilogy, so you kind of could just do a God Emperor thing. It would just be extremely weird. I I think just, like, an animation series. I mean, almost just a series of YouTube videos. I mean, all right, I mean, it's called The Ultimate Guide to God Emperor by Quinn's Ideas. If you just go to the YouTube channel Quinn's Ideas and watch Quinn's videos about God Emperor, I think that's, I think that's the, that's, that's all you need in terms of an adaptation of God Emperor. Um, Will says, do you prefer the bu- the book's bird-like ornithopter or the film's bug-like ornithopter? I like the book's bird-like ornithopters. I, I love that the ornithopters have feathers in the book. I think the feathers are really just lovely and science fictional and they 
evoke some really cool designs by fan artists, like these ones by Alex J. Brady. I think having feathers and being bird-like is really evocative and cool and fantastical. Um, I, I think the more sort of industrial military metal wings in uh, the movie don't work so well, um, if only because I can't imagine that thing flying, you know? I mean, they do look like dragonflies, though, and that's super kawaii. So, you know, that's cool. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Rusty Shacklefart, who says, love your work. Thanks for doing what you do. Uh, thank you for the donation from K Shatiria or K Shatria, who says, I don't know anything about Dune. I was confused the whole time. More cyberpunk myself. Is spice just worm poop? I'm glad you asked, K Shatria. Um, so I'm not going to reveal what the exact connection is between sandworms and spice, because that's kind of a spoiler for the, um, for later. Um, but there is, there is an answer. It's not an entirely satisfying answer necessarily, but there is, there is, there, there is, there is stuff to be learned about the worms and the spice. But like, I, what I will say is that like sandworm, spice is not so much sandworm poop. I, it's, it's more sandworm ejaculate. Spice is not worm poo, it's more worm cum, is what spice is, uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, there is a whole thing, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, it involves the worms. Okay, anyway, thanks for the super chat from Matthew, who says, I just wanted to check something. Can you say, thanks, you bloody legends? Is that good? Thanks, you bloody legends. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Cashel, who says, Messiah and God Emperor kind of represent Herbert at his most self-indulgent and navel-gazy, and I kind of love them both as a result. Yeah, I agree, Cashel. Like, like, yeah, like, God Emperor of Dune is maybe the most Frank Herbert-y of all of the books. Like, like, D like Dune 1, like, Dune 1 is sort of the least Dune-like of any of the Dune books. Like, like Dune is Dune is just like the prologue to the Dune series, really. Like it, it just, it just, it, it, it's only the beginning. Like, like the Dune story doesn't really start until like book two and book three. I mean, it starts in like book two and book three, and it also goes way off the rails in book two and book three. Like shit gets weird real quick. Uh, thanks for the super chat from uh, Gabriel, who says, I've had the first book of the saga for two years, but can't get past the first hundred pages. Do you have any tips to make the reading more fluid? Uh, have you tried blending it into a delicious milk? Okay, that's a bad joke. Uh, fluid. Um, <sighs> tips. I, I think that you have to embrace the idea of not knowing everything that's going on. Because the book absolutely throws a bunch of terminology and plot lines and characters that you don't know what they mean or what they're doing. And you have to roll with it. And that is part of the point of Dune. Because Dune is about going with the flow and, and having, having, like, accepting the uncertain. Accepting the unknown. Being comfortable with not knowing is part of the message of Dune. And so in order to read Dune, you have to accept that message. You have to accept that... I don't know what a Kwisatz Haderach is or a Gom Jabbar is right away, but I have to just sort of think about it and puzzle it out, look at the clues and sort of accept that I can learn more things later and just sort of go with it. Um, so I think that's my advice. Go go with it. Um, and if you got to give up, um, then watch my YouTube videos and watch Quinn's YouTube videos. <laughs> that's my advice. Uh, okay. All right, there's still some things I'd like to talk about. Um, what haven't we talked about yet? Uh, so later. So we talked about in the real Dune YouTube video that Leto Atreides is... There's a sense of doom about him. There's a sense that Leto uh, is screwed. He can't beat the Emperor. He's going to die. And he kind of knows it. There's one of the sort of quotes at the start of each chapter that says that, you know, historians wonder, did Leto know he was going to die? Did he willingly walk into the abyss? Uh, or was he wily like his son and he sort of knew what he was doing? Did he sacrifice himself? Like, that, that that's how it, it really plays with this idea that Leto was doomed and he knew it. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, this idea of he sort of knew the future in a way. Leto knew he was going to be attacked and he had a very strong suspicion that he was not going to survive. Um, he has death thoughts in the book. And 
knowing the future didn't save him. And that connects to the ideas of prescience and future sight in the books, because, you know, Paul has all these visions of the future. You know, he has visions of, of Jamis being his friend, but then Jamis, he, he's forced to kill Jamis. And he sees visions of Duncan, and, and then Duncan dies. Like, he has a vision of Duncan dying, and he says, Hey, Duncan, I saw a vision of you dying. Better not die, bro. And then Duncan died. So the point is that, like, well, what's the point of visions of the future if we don't get the future we want? You know, what, what, what's the point of knowing the future if we can't change it? What, what, what's the point of these dreams and visions if they're not guaranteed to come true? If you want it to come true, it still might not come true. So what's the point? So, so, so really, like, the visions in Dune, in a lot of ways, they're not like magical guaranteed destiny. It's more like the imagination and the dreams and the plans that we have in the real world. We can make things come true by imagining them. But does that mean that we had future sight? We, we have magic? We have destiny? No. And we can have things that we want to avoid, but they might, ha- they might happen anyway. So, so all these sort of questions around, like, what does it really mean to think about the future is something that Frank Herbert was very interested in. And I think Frank Herbert's basic message was that, A, like, you, you, you can't really ever fully predict the future or control the future. No matter how smart you are, you can be a Mentat, you can be a Bene Gesserit, you can be the bloody Kwisatz Haderach, you still can't know everything, you still can't control everything. The universe is constantly subject to flux and change and randomness, and that's good. Life is joyous and life is meaningful because of the surprises and the spontaneity and the serendipity. It's good. Um, so those are themes that continue on throughout Dune, is the ideas of the future and prescience and what that really means, because we might think that knowledge of the future can save us, we might think that we can control the future, but we can't. That, that, that's kind of part of the message, but, you know, it does get a lot more complicated than that. Something else I wanted to talk about was, uh, Jessica and Leto. Um, so I, I generally like how they depicted... Uh, Jessica and Leto's relationship in the movie. Um, they took out the thing where Leto pretends to suspect Jessica of being a traitor, which happens in the book, but not in the movie. But I, I like that they still had some moments of distrust between Leto and Jessica. Like, the movie invented this scene where Leto says, Hey, Jessica, uh, you better not be loyal to the Bene Gesserit and not to us. Are you going to protect Paul? And that that wasn't in the book, but it is in the spirit of... Uh, the book, because, you know, there is tension and there is some suspicion between Leto and Jessica. So I think that's a a good um, addition to the movie in lieu of the traitor plot. Uh, but something, but, you know, like we, we talk about in... So in the conversation between Thufir and Jessica, uh, Thufir points out that Leto never married Jessica as sort of a challenge to Jessica. And Jessica replies to Thufir, if I desired a puppet, the Duke would marry me. He might even think he did it of his own free will. And I think that's a really interesting line, because it shows the depth of Bene Gesserit control. Like, Jessica's confident that with her Bene Gesserit powers, she could manipulate Leto. I mean, she might not even have to use the voice, just just through, like, emotional manipulation by reading him, by manipulating him, by conditioning him. That That's what the Bene Gesserit do. They are super manipulative, emotionally, physically, biologically. They have all sorts of ways to manipulate people, sexually. And then that's something that happens in uh, books five and six, sexual control. There's all sorts of crazy stuff that happens. But my point is that Jessica says that she totally could control Leto and make him love her. Sorry, make him marry her. He does love her. Um, But she chooses not to because she doesn't want to deprive him of his free will. And obviously that's a contrast with like the Harkonnens and the Emperor who have slaves Um, the bad guys do not respect people's free will, uh, but the heroes, insofar as there are heroes in Dune, uh, they do respect freedom and agency, and there's all sorts of cool stuff that goes on in, like, book two, uh, with that. Um, but, um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that Jessica could control Leto, but the other side to that, another layer to that, is that, so, like, you know, we know that Jessica is not Leto's wife. She is his concubine. And and something that's interesting is that Jessica, I, I think, might be Leto's slave, technically. Uh, because the book mentions how, like, you know, like, like Jessica was a Bene Gesserit at the Bene Gesserit school. And she was bought to become Leto's wife. The Duke's buyers took her. Uh, and Jessica says that she is the 
bound concubine of Duke Leto. She is bound. Um, and so it's never really explained exactly how it works, but it sounds to me like she might be a slave. Uh, I mean, like, there are slave concubines of the Emperor mentioned. Um, so I think slave concubines are a thing. Um, and, of course, you know, the Bene Gesserit, they put their Bene Gesserit women out into the world as tools to control powerful people. But, you know, the Emperor and the Houses don't know that. So I, I think that while the Bene Gesserit are these manipulative, powerful people, I, I think that in some cases, and I think in Jessica's case, she is supposedly, ostensibly, technically, a slave of Leto. Um, and, you know, Leto treats Jessica with respect and allows her choice and free will to a certain extent. There is a sort of a, I mean, there is some sort of commanding patriarchal vibe that Leto has with Jessica. Um, and Jessica plays a sort of a domestic role in the books where she has sort of domestic duties around the house, you know, sort of like a traditional feminine role, you know, a wifely role in certain ways. But at the same time, Jessica has secret plans of her own and is capable of manipulating later. So my point is that there are some very sort of interesting and layered, uh, complexities with the power relationship and the personal relationship between Leto and Jessica. Um... Yeah, I think that's all I want to say. Thanks for the super chat from OGs, who says, We're glad the new movie did not incorporate... Were you glad that the new movie did not incorporate the vocal warfare that the older movies had? Yeah, I, I talked about that. The Lynch movie had these weirding modules that turned the voice into, like, a ray gun, which I think is ridiculous, and I'm glad they removed it. Um, something I wanted to talk about with the Baron Vladimir is that in the book, the Baron keeps on denying his agency. And what I mean by this is the Baron keeps saying that, oh, you know, there's a scene where he says, I don't want to torture Leto, but I have to torture Leto if he doesn't tell me what I need to know. Oh, Leto, don't force me to torture you, but I'll have to if you don't tell me what I want. Um, and, you know, even like sending the hunter seeker to kill Paul, he's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to kill Paul, but, I, but I have to, to use it as a distraction to attack the Atreides. And so, and so he, he's constantly sort of denying responsibility for his own actions and his own crimes. And he constantly blames other people for his evil acts. Like he, he blames Piter and Raban and he blames the Atreides for forcing him to do what he's doing. Um, and so, you know, Dune is all about people taking conscious, deliberate responsibility for their actions. It's all about people choosing. And the the ultimate evil, the villain, the Baron, he's constantly denying that he has a choice. He's constantly denying that he's in control of himself in the same way that he doesn't control his, you know, consumption of food and his sexual crimes, etc. So I think that's a really interesting subtlety that the Baron, the Baron explicitly says he has no choice. He acts as though he has no control over himself, which is what makes him evil. But but the other thing about the Baron that I think is kind of legit is that the Baron says he 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 he's like a cynical realist. Like he's 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 a cynic. He doesn't believe in the heroic ideals of Leto. He describes Leto as this prize person who denies his for hire. You know, as though, like, Leto thinks he's so high and mighty. Leto thinks that he's honorable and just, but really, it's bullshit. Vladimir thinks, the Baron thinks, that he is cutting away the masks from fools, exposing the hell beneath. So, like, the Baron is not someone who's like, ha ha ha, I'm an evil villain who wants to destroy all of the genuinely good and heroic forces in the world. No. The Baron is someone who's saying, yeah, I'm a piece of shit. And so are you. He is cutting away the mask to expose the hell. He's saying that everyone is just evil and depraved deep down. He's saying that, that goodness and heroism is bullshit. And, like, there is truth to that. Because, you know, he uses the phrase cutting away the masks from fools. And Leto thinks that he wears a, quote, mask. He cultivates an air of bravura. He uses propaganda. Like, Leto... Dune is about questioning heroes, fundamentally, and, and Vladimir also questions heroes. So, like, v Vladimir mostly is just evil all the way down. Like, he mostly is just an embodiment of everything that Dune 
considers bad in humanity, like namely failing to self, failing to control yourself, overindulgence in pleasure and decadence, delighting in taking away people's agency, causing pain, all of that kind of evil. Um, but I think it's really interesting that the Baron does kind of have a point with his cynical realism, because his skepticism of Leto's heroism is legit, it's true. Like, beneath the mask, there is a hell beneath, to some extent. Uh, another thing about the Baron that's cool is that in the book, like, the Baron comes down to Arrakis when he takes over from the Atreides, and, you know, after he defeats the Atreides, and the the book specifies that, you know, like, like in the movie, the Baron comes into the um, Atreides residency on Arrakeen. But in the book, the Baron stays in his spaceship. He doesn't go out into the desert. He doesn't go out into the city. He stays inside his spaceship with its luxurious... The luxurious comforts and furniture that he has. All of this opulent furniture. Um, the Baron is separating himself from the environment. And that exact... And that's one of the, like, the follies of Dune, right? Like, one of the messages of Dune is that you can't separate yourself from the environment. Um, you are always part of your environment. You're always part of those, the forces of the world that you're on. You can't escape that. And so, the Baron's attempts to separate himself from the environment by staying inside his spaceship and not going out into the desert um, fits with that theme. And that's something that uh, continues into the story. Um so yeah, I thought that was cool. Um, we talked about the jihad on Caladan. Uh, do you want to talk about the bagpipes? A lot of people found it funny that there were bagpipes uh, played by the Atreides on Dune. There are some quotes by uh, the director, Denny Villeneuve, explaining that. Like, he, he, he likes that the bagpipes sort of link the culture of the Atreides to Earth history. The idea that this music has survived over thousands of years. It's like something brought from Earth, something brought from home sort of a traditional instrument. Uh, he saw the Atreides as a kind of Celtic people, Den Denny said. Uh, so that's his justification for the bagpipes. Um, something little is that when Paul fights Jamis in the book, uh, he notices that Jamis's cuts, when he gets cut by Paul's knife, um, his wounds heal very quickly. And so I think I think Jessica in the book um, speculates that the Fremen have some kind of ultra fast blood coagulation adaptation, which is part of how they uh, reduce the loss of moisture in the desert. They don't cry, um, they don't waste water, they recycle their water in still suits, and they their cuts close super quickly to preserve moisture. Also, I suppose, to preserve, you know, blood, so you don't, you know, die, but whatever. Um, Pardo Kynes. So, so we talked about how Liet Kynes' father, Pardo Kynes, was the one who first sort of taught the Fremen about ecology and convinced them to start changing the environment of Arrakis. Um, and it seems like this noble goal to transform Arrakis from an inhospitable desert into a paradise with plants and water. But one of the sort of wrinkles in that is that Pardo is a dick. <laughs> um, in the appendix, it, it, it sort of tells the story of Pardo, and it talks about how Pardo, Pardo saw the Fremen as, quote, the tools with which he intended to remake a planet. So Pardo was not like a totally great guy who was just altruistically wanting to help the Fremen and make Arrakis better. He, he sort of coldly saw the Fremen not as people, but as tools that he was using to change the planet. Um, but it's, it is sort of more complicated than that because, you know, Pardo also killed Harkonnens and risked his life to save Fremen. Like, you sort of get the sense from the Appendix of Dune that Pardo was not a people person. <laughs> Like, like, it even says that, like, you know, Pardo had a Fremen wife, but it doesn't talk about his great love for his Fremen wife. It just says that, uh, you know, like, he needed more uh, acceptance with the Fremen people and, like, hooking up with this Fremen woman and marrying her was a way of, like, buying acceptance by the Fremen to get more control of the Fremen is sort of the implication, at least in how I read it. 
Like, Pardo was just kind of a weirdo who just didn't really care about people. He just cared about his scientific, ecological goal of changing the planet, mostly just out of sheer scientific curiosity. He seemed sort of oblivious to anything other than his scientific goals, and he sort of treated people as objects, which is villainous. It's sort of like how the Baron uses people like objects. So... My point is that, you know, like, Pardo is dead before the story starts. He's not an important character. But, like, from the appendix, he, he does sound like kind of a, just a weird, ambiguous dude. Uh, the, uh, the Dune prequel stories written by Frank Herbert's son um, tell a different story and make him into more of a generic protagonist, from what I can tell from what I've read of that book. But Pardo is, like, kind of a dick and a weirdo. <laughs> He's, like, a, just, a, just a weird scientist who, who is only interested in ecological facts and not in people. And that it just makes him more of a narrow-minded, inhuman kind of dick. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'm sledging him too hard. Like, Pardo is not, a, like, a villain, but... um. But, you know, I mean, Kynes is kind of similar. Like, like Kynes kind of is a Fremen, and Kynes is, you know, genuinely cares about the Fremen dream, but, like, also kind of uses and manipulates people. It's Everything's complicated in June. No one is just good or bad, and there are nuances to all of these characters. Um, but th there's definitely an arrogance to both Pardo and Liette Kynes uh, that we should definitely question. Um... Thanks for the donation from Russ, who says, What do you think about the fact that Fatboy Slim's song, Weapons of Choice, was about Dune, and now it's come full circle with Christopher Walken as the Emperor? Yeah, so the actor Christopher Walken will play the Emperor Shaddam IV in the next Dune movie, and Christopher Walken was once in a Fatboy Slim music video that has lyrics inspired by Dune. It is a wonderful serendipity. Or maybe it maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe Denny Villeneuve cast Christopher Walken based exclusively on his performance, his wonderful dance in that video. If you haven't seen that video, go and go and watch it. It's great. It's great preparation for Dune Part Two. <laughs> it, it it reminds me of how um, Kit Harrington, who play played past tense, who played Jon Snow on the Game of Thrones TV show. Uh, has now been cast to play, or has already played, uh, a Marvel superhero called the Black Knight, I think. Uh, and his name is Dane Whitman, uh, the, the Marvel superhero. This is like an old 60s Marvel superhero called Dane Whitman. And Dane Whitman, I'm pretty sure, was one of the inspirations behind House Dane. Uh, who are a house in the Game of Thrones books by George Martin, because George Martin was a huge comic book nerd. He specifically was a big fan of Marvel Comics, and he wrote letters that were published in Marvel Comics um, in the uh, before times. Um, and so I think it's really sort of funny and wonderful that the... Um, that Kit Harrington is now playing a character, Dane Whitman, who George Martin drew from as inspiration for House Dane in the Game of Thrones books about Jon Snow, which were then played by Kit Harrington. It comes full circle. And specifically, like, I think that uh, Dane Whitman inspired House Dane because Dane Whitman has a sword that's made from a stone that fell from the sky, just like House Dane has a sword called Dawn that comes from a stone that fell from the sky. But that's Game of Thrones stuff. That's for another live stream. Anyway, um, thanks for the live chat from Georgie, who says, Hey, ASX, just wanted to say that I love your videos and keep up the amazing work. Dune is an amazing universe, and I'm glad to see more attention brought to it. Dune really, really is something special. So I'm very happy to be making videos about this crazy, crazy series. Um, and I'm looking forward to making more. I would like to... I mean, there's going to be another video called The Philosophy of Dune, which is going to talk about the themes and the meaning of Dune, specifically the first, like, three or four books, because uh, we couldn't really talk about that in the real Dune video without spoiling the rest of the story. So we're going to do a more spoilery video. Um, it's already it's already in the works that will uh, just sort of summarize the themes and the meaning. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Dusk Just Jerked Off, 
and the super chat from Emily C, who says, love your videos. Thanks, Emily. Um, what else haven't I said? Um, we talked about the sense of stagnancy in the Empire, and the Sardaka became overconfident. Uh, we... Oh, something else I'd like to talk about is drugs. Um, so, there's a lot of drugs in Dune. Uh, <clears throat> there's the Spice Melange, and there's the uh, awareness-enhancing narcotic spectrum narcotics that are mentioned, uh, which sometimes are spice and sometimes are not. Uh, depending on who you ask in the books. Uh, and there's also the Sappho that the Mentats take. Um, and so it sort of makes sense that in a story about the power of the mind and, in, and all the different ways you can change your perception and change your awareness, it makes sense that drugs will be part of that story. Um, and I tried to figure out if Frank Herbert was someone who liked to use drugs, um, like psychedelics, um, and... I got a sort of mixed but interesting story. So, um, there is there are some people who claim that Frank Herbert was like a very enthusiastic user of uh, psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms. Um, there was a writer called Paul Stamets, who apparently is a renowned authority in the world of shrooms, who says that Frank was heavily inspired uh, by mushrooms when he wrote June. He went so far as to say that uh, the blue color of spice comes from the blue color of a particular species of mushrooms. He says that the um, he says that the uh, folding of space is based on like uh, visual effects from tripping on mushrooms. He said that the sandworms in Dune are specifically inspired by maggots that appear on mushrooms and digest mushrooms in the life cycle of the mushroom. And he said that the Bene Gesserit were, in, were inspired by sacred mushroom cults in Mexico. So there have been a lot of very specific claims about how uh, mushrooms and other drugs have inspired Frank Herbert, but I haven't found any direct quotes or any interviews or any evidence of Frank talking directly about any of that being true. Um, but we do know that Frank was very interested in mushrooms. Like, Frank's son, Brian Herbert, uh, wrote in his biography of, of Frank that, that Frank apparently was a very enthusiastic cultivator of mushrooms. He didn't mention magic mushrooms, but he was very enthusiastic about mushrooms. And he, and he used to, like, go and forage for mushrooms, and he used to cook them for the family, and he knew a lot about cultivating mushrooms. So that made me think, well, okay, maybe, maybe it's true the claim that Frank Herbert was heavily inspired by psychedelic mushrooms. Um, there are other stories from several sources about how he sort of like accidentally took some hashish candy in Mexico, and he, and he once chose to have some peyote tea, but he said that all it gave him was a headache. Um, but there are, in one interview, Frank did say that, um, where's the full quote? I think that in some instances it has been helped by drugs, but I don't think drugs are the answer. I think drugs tend to be self-delimiting. People who come to rely on them begin to lose consciousness. We see this quite dramatically. That's something that Frank said in an interview. Um, it's a dead-end street, he says, using hallucinogens to attain visionary experiences. So, you know, I, I just found it interesting to sort of figure out what Frank's relationship to drugs was. Um, and basically, I couldn't find any real sort of, like, proof of what he was into or what he had used. He definitely had some interest. It sounds like he might have tried some stuff, but basically came to the conclusion that um, drugs aren't the answer to everything. Complicated, you know, controversial opinion, I know. But I just thought that was interesting, given, like, the role of, like, spice in... Dune. Um, for all the significance of uh, drugs unlocking the mind in Dune, I don't think that Frank Herbert would uh, endorse such experimentation. Thanks for the super chat from Leech Millie Fee, who says, love your content, hyped that you're covering Dune. Thanks for the super chat from God Emperor of Memes, who says, there's a Dune tabletop RPG that's flown under the radar in nerd circles, Adventures in the Imperium. You and Quinn giving it a go would be top shelf memes. Whew, that would be fun. 
yeah, there is some artwork from that RPG in the real Dune video. And uh, yeah, I suggest that everyone go and check that RPG out. Have a have a tabletop sesh. Play as a Mentat. Play as a Reverend Mother. Play as uh, Bajaz the Dwarf. Get weird with it. Um, the the Orange Catholic Bible is fun. Uh, there is a holy text in Dune called the Orange Catholic Bible, and there's a backstory to it in the appendix. Um, it's it's weird. It, it tells us that the Orange Catholic Bible includes elements of lots of ancient real religions. So, uh, the Maometh Sari, Mahayana Christianity, Zen Sunni Catholicism, and Buddh Islamic traditions. So, like, in this far, far future, all of these real religions we know today have sort of changed and evolved and merged and split and turned into these sort of new syncretic forms in the future. Um, and, and the history of the Orange Catholic Bible is that basically the Butlerian Jihad happened. They went out and broke the robots and lots of people died and it was kind of a disaster, but they killed the robots and they were like, okay, what do we do now? Um... Maybe we need to, like, work together. <laughs> maybe we need to chill. Maybe we need to get our shit together. So what the people of the universe did is they they got a bunch of religious experts and these religious experts got together on Earth and they sat down and they formed a, a committee and they were like, okay, let's, let's make one single religious text that brings everything together and makes it all make sense and it'll be great. And everyone was like, is it a good idea to just smush all the religions together to settle all the agreements? But they're like, no, 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 it'll, it'll be great. And it took seven years. And eventually they did manage to write a document called the Orange Catholic Bible. And this was a deliberate, like artificially created document that would combine all the good bits from all the popular religions and would cut out all the bad bits and would hopefully get, uh, create some unity and allow everyone to work together and there won't be so much religious war anymore because everyone will be on the same page, everyone will have the same book and there won't be any divisive religious differences anymore, we'll all be together and we'll, we'll sing Kumbaya and it'll be great. Um, spoiler, that didn't work out so well. Um, there were riots and deaths and everyone hated the Orange Catholic Bible and they hated that it sort of erased the symbols of their ancient religions and they hated that it sort of artificially tried to smooth over all the differences. People did not like this uh, artificially created syncretic new religion. It's a little bit like Esperanto, come to think of it. You know, Esperanto is a language that, that people just invented because they're like, hey... Let's make a language that everyone can speak. Instead of speaking all the old languages, we'll all speak Esperanto. It'll be really logical and sensible. That's that's what the Orange Catholic Bible is like, come to think of it. Because people are like, yeah, let's 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 logically construct a religious text. And everyone hated it. But here's the thing. Despite the fact that the initial reaction to the Orange Catholic Bible was violent and negative... The Orange Catholic Bible still spread around the universe and has now become the most popular religious text in the universe, and it is widely used in in the worlds of Dune. Um, so, so it's a very confusing story, where that where this is this is one of the appendices of Dune, where they just say that yeah, so they so they wrote a new Bible, they they wrote a sequel to the Bible, and. It, it was a bad idea, and everyone hated it, but it became the dominant religion anyway. <laughs> That's basically the story. And I don't, I don't really know what the moral of that story is. Uh, I mean, it sort of fits with the idea that religion is uh, something that can be manipulated. Like, just like the missionary productiva, you know, the Bene Gesserit artificially manipulate religion. And, like, you know, I think that one of the ideas of Dune is that it's wrong to manipulate religion. Like, it's kind of fucked up to apply logic and politics and, and cold reason to religion, which is something that should be, like, felt. Like, it, it's said in the appendix that, like, you know that religion is real when it, it tells you something that you already knew in your heart and it blah, blah, blah. So, like, you know, like, Dune is skeptical of religion, but it also suggests that there is something real in some religious insights. There is something real there. And that reflects how Frank Herbert draws from Zen Buddhism and, and Islam and Sufism. And, 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 you know, Frank Herbert is very skeptical of religion. And he says that religion is a dangerous weapon 
Specifically, religious institutions can be corrupt and bureaucratic, and religious messianic leaders can be dangerous, but, but he does also say that religions can have true insight. Um, and so, Frank Herbert has a complicated um, relationship with religion. He was raised by a gaggle of Catholic nuns who inspired the Bene Gesserit, and he kind of hated them, but kind of also loved them. Um, it's a weird, interesting story. I, I guess that's my point. Um, here's another tiny, cool tidbit. Nukes. Um, Dune was written in the shadow of the Cold War, and there's a lot of anxiety about nuclear weapons uh, in Dune. And so one of the fundamental rules of the Great Convention, which is like the rules of war and the political alliance between the Houses and the Emperor and the Spacing Guild, one of the foundational rules in this universe is you must not use nukes against people. You, you, you cannot use nukes against other humans. That is absolutely banned. Um, but there is an asterisk. There is, there is a caveat. Nuclear... Here's a quote from um, one of the later Dune books. It's not a spoiler. Here's a quote. Nuclear weapons were a reserve held for one purpose. Defense of humankind should a threatening other intelligence ever be encountered. So basically, they're keeping the nukes just in case of aliens. Uh, you're not allowed to nuke people, but if some little green men ever turn up, it's open season. <laughs> um, I, I just think that's kind of cool that the people in June are like, yeah, let's not nuke each other, but if there's aliens, we might need some nukes. Uh, so keep them in your back pocket. Uh, we talked about uh, folding space, how that's like not a thing in the first few Dune books, but it is a thing in the later Dune books. Instantaneous travel is only something that happens later. And I do kind of like the idea that, um, you know, how the Space and Guild navigators need to take spice. They need to get high in order to fly a spaceship. Um, I'm pretty sure that is a plot line in uh, Rick and Morty. Season four, you know, when like Summer has to like huff the alien drug in order to fly the spaceship. It's Dune. That's got to be a Dune reference. Um, the Spacing Guild are described in the book as being like really creepy and inhuman. They're like a parasite lurking in space, like bleeding humanity dry for their money and plotting and scheming. And that's something we could have emphasized more in the Dune video was the um, sinister parasitic nature of the Spacing Guild. Purge the Xenos, Nick Grimes says. Yeah, look, th there are a lot of parallels between Dune and 40k. Uh, Google it, you will find many, many, many. Um, poison. Let's talk about poison. Um, so Dune always talks about how language is very revealing and ra language is very significant. The words we use control the way we think and the words we use reflect political realities. And so that's why in Dune, there are at least seven different words for ways to poison people. Ormas, chormas, chormurky, murky, musky. The gomjabar is a poison needle. The mauler pistol shoots poison darts. There are poison snoopers to detect poison. The slip tip is a needle, is a knife that's usually poisoned. Residual poison is a special kind of poison. These are all different words which are made up for Dune. And the fact that there are like 10 different specialized terminology for poison shows how common poison is and how important poison is. Um, and I just think it's ridiculous that there's that many words. Uh, and it makes a point about language in Dune. Uh, we talked about the memories of Earth on Dune. Um, and I think one last thing I want to say, another tiny little factoid that didn't make it into the real Dune video, is that uh, shields attract sandworms in the book. Uh, they mention that if you put on a shield, uh, you know, the force field that protects you, if you, put on, if you turn on one of those shields in the deserts of Arrakis, every sandworm from like a hundred miles around will get very angry and will swim towards you very quickly. For some reason, uh, shields uh, cause sandworms to go into a violent frenzy. They just hate force fields. Um, and that is the main reason why the Fremen don't use shields. 
Like, they they are technologically advanced, but they choose not to use shields because they anger sandworms and the Fremen have a relationship with the sandworms. So, um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, Fry in the live chat says, do we ever meet the other great houses in Dune? In the books written by Frank Herbert, we don't. No, it's basically just like Atreides and Harkonnens and Carinos. Um, I I did include in the Real Dune video the heraldry of some other houses, some minor houses, but even the heraldry wasn't invented by Frank Herbert. There was this book called the Dune Encyclopedia that was written by someone else that like filled in a bunch of the world building and created sigils and heraldry and history for all these other houses. And it's a cool book, the Dune Encyclopedia, but um, in terms of what Frank wrote... Doesn't go into a lot of that detail, no. Um, thanks for the super chat from The Burning Ice Cream, who says, uh, is Old Shift X likely to do Lovecraft deep dives? Maybe The Shadow Over Innsmouth, Deep One's Law, HP's Weird Racism, how modern writers subvert that weird racism into great horror. I, I mean, Lovecraft's weird, because, <laughs> I mean, Old Shift X is mostly about, like, explaining stuff, for better or worse, shift-splaining, um, and some stories are made better by explaining the mysteries, and some stories are not made better by explaining the mysteries, and I think H.P. Lovecraft, the point is the mystery, not the answers, usually, you know? Um, I, I don't think that, I don't think there's all that much to explain in Lovecraft, apart from Ooh, that's spooky. <laughs> that makes me feel weird. That's that's upsetting. Um, I think they sort of explain themselves, you know. Um, I mean, you know, there are. I, I mean, like there are YouTube videos that like explain Lovecraft lore. Here's the full timeline of Lovecraft. Here's every different. Here's the difference between Cthulhu and Yathold Tep and and the other one. And you know, like like there there is lore you can talk about, but I don't know if it's the story that most benefits from explanation. There isn't really like a single cohesive canon or overarching story in Lovecraft anyway. So I mean, look, I I. I do like Lovecraft, and maybe we could make old Shift X videos about Lovecraft at some point, but I'm, I don't know if it would be the best series. Because it's, it's, it's not even a series. I, like, yeah, I don't know if it would work. I mean, you, you mentioned, like, the weird racism and how it can be subverted. I mean, uh, Daniel Abraham, one of the authors of The Expanse, was saying that Jeff Vandermeer who wrote Annihilation, the Southern Reach trilogy. You know Annihilation, the sci-fi movie with Natalie Portman, and there's a mirror Natalie Portman, and there's weird plants and deers, and they go into the Shimmer Zone in Area X. Uh, It's a cool book, and it's a cool movie, and Jeff Vandermeer was grappling with the idea of cosmic horror, and, like, cosmic horror, in the way that Lovecraft wrote it, was about the fear of the other, Lovecraft was basically terrified of anyone who wasn't a, um, a white British aristocrat. <laughs> um, and so a lot of the bad guys are, are, there's a lot of xenophobia in Lovecraft. And so what um, Jeff Vandermeer did in Annihilation was that he went for a different kind of cosmic horror. Instead of looking, being afraid of like cultures and histories and bygone bloodlines, uh, he, it, it's a fear of like an alien biology, like a literally alien biology and all of the ways that biology in our own world can sort of mutate and, and alter and evolve and be symbiotic and parasitic. And, um, it, it's a very cool kind of cosmic horror that is very different to what Lovecraft did. And I do suggest that everyone go and read the Southern Reach trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, the Annihilation movie is cool, I like the Annihilation movie, but there's a lot more going on in the book. I feel like I say that a lot. Does, does anyone else think I say that a lot? <laughs> there's a lot more going on in the book. In the book, it's different. Um, but yeah, Annihilation is really cool. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Stuff Hobbs, who says, Love your stuff. Is there an inherent contradiction between Dune's philosophy, don't trust charismatic leaders, and Paul's awesomeness, the hero's journey? Yeah, well, without spoiling anything, Dune Book 1 is that hero's journey. It's the it's the book that makes you love Paul. Uh, and then the sequel books change things. <laughs> 
without spoiling anything, that's what I'll say. It changes things. Um, uh, thanks for the super chat from Adam, who says, I noticed in your video, when talking about the Butlerian Jihad, you skipped the stuff about Agamemnon and Omnius. Can you elucidate more on them? So, in the prequel books, written by Frank Herbert's son, Brian, there is a lot of other stuff going on. Um, there is a literal robot war against Skynet that happens in the Butlerian Jihad in the, uh, prequel books. Um, I haven't read all those prequel books, um... I know that I know that Quinn from Quinn's Ideas uh, has, and um, so sort of drawing from what he's said about the subject. Uh, my understanding of those prequel books is that th- th- they pretty dramatically changed the point of what Frank Herbert was writing about. Um, like the Butlerian Jihad, as it's described in Frank Herbert's books, it was the the problem was that robots and AI and like that kind of technology was misused by humans to dominate other humans. And that sucked. Uh, the problem was humans misusing technology. Whereas in Brian Herbert's prequel books, he turns it into, oh no, the T-800s got loose, better fight them with guns. Um, it, it, it's sort of a different story. So I can't comment on that story because I haven't read that story. And I'm kind of not that interested in that story because it's an entirely different thematic thing to Frank Herbert's Dune books, um, to my understanding. Maybe, you know, I, I, I hope one day to read them and then I'll have a real opinion about them. Um, and yeah, the Agamemnon thing, yeah, I understand that, like, the Atreides, like, the Atreides in Frank Herbert's books, it talks about how they are descended from the House of Atreus and Agamemnon from ancient Greece, and uh, my understanding is that in the Brian Herbert books, it's like, oh, wait, Agamemnon, he's actually a robot. It was a robot, but not a not not a real thing. It's a myth that they're descended from the real Atreus. I don't know. It's um maybe one day I'll read them, but I haven't yet and um can't really comment on them properly. Okay. We are going to finish up this live stream very shortly. If you have any more burning questions or things you want uh, me to talk about with Dune, uh chuck it in the live chat now. Um but uh yeah. Uh, Severian says, have you read Ambergris by Vandermeer? It is better than Annihilation. I have not. But, uh, hey, Ambergris is pretty cool. Isn't Am- isn't Ambergris like the, the vomit of whales, which for some reason is used in perfume and it's super valuable? It sounds made up. It sounds like spice, actually. Uh, Ambergris sounds like spice. Hmm. Um... John in the live chat says, you need to read the Brian Herbert prequels if you're going to criticize them. Don't be another hater just because some people don't like them. Make your own informed opinion. I think that's good advice, John. You're right. I haven't read those books, so yeah, I can't have a real opinion about them. But, you know, from what I've heard about them, um, they're not the thing that I'm most interested in reading right now. Um... Batbrush says, why do you think Dune has such a lasting appeal? Because it's about timeless questions about like, how should we use our minds and what kind of political system should we live in? And should we follow leaders? Um, and what would it be like to ride a giant worm across a desert? You know, like, like it's about really fundamental stuff. And also there's things about how it's written like I talked about before in terms of how the description is quite minimal, but evocative, which makes it feel sort of timeless, you know? Um, and sort of, you know, the religious ideas and like, you know, that, that they are, they do feel, and, and it, it sort of feels like it's in its own time in its own era, you know, like it's not tied to any particular style or trend. Like it's, it's, it's not, it's not of its time. It feels like it's of every time, you know? I mean, you know, it does have some stuff that sort of ages it, but um, it feels unique. Uh, Dune feels like it stands alone. And I think part of that is like the language that it uses. I mean, it's kind of funny because like Frank Herbert just like borrowed and stole from a bunch of different languages and religions and cultures and sort of mishmashed it into his own pastiche. Mishmashed into a pastiche. Pastiche. I, I, can't, I can't talk. We're going to end this soon. Um, but I think that, yeah, Dune is about timeless themes and ideas and it is super relevant now. Like, my God, like (laughs) when I think about what Frank Herbert would think about what's going on in the world right now, I mean, Frank Herbert wrote about the dangers of letting machines think for you. 
Uh, machines think for us so much now. Algorithms probably suggested this live stream for you to watch. You wouldn't be watching this live stream if it wasn't for algorithms making decisions for you to a greater or lesser extent. Like you found Alt Shift X through YouTube's robot algorithms. If Frank Herbert was around, he would suggest a Butlerian Jihad to destroy the algorithm, and I'm not sure I would disagree with him. And you know, smartphones and social media and automation of all kinds, I think Frank would be very disturbed by. I think Frank would be very disturbed by a lot of what's going on, like culturally and politically and and messianic leaders, political leaders, and all sorts of stuff. He would be have some strong opinions. Um, thanks for the super chat from Taylor, who says, would you have any thoughts about Chapter House and the new HBO series? I've not read the sixth Dune book, Chapter House Dune, yet, so I can't comment. There is an HBO series being made about the Bene Gesserit, um, which could be cool, might be terrible. Like, the the Bene Gesserit are so sort of mysterious, and I, I think that it might be a bad idea to... It might be a bad idea to demystify the Bene Gesserit because their their mystery is so cool and their mysticism is so cool. So should we demystify it? I don't know. But also the Bene Gesserit are so ripe for drama. Like just like all the stuff we talked about with Jessica and Gaius. Like the Bene Gesserit have their duty to their thousand year old plans and their rationality and their power and their politics, but they also have their emotion. It's all the Bene Gesserit are all about like controlling their emotion and their relationships and manipulating people and like, you know, marrying people for political reasons, but then what if you fall in love with them like Jessica did? So I I think there is lots of room for cool stories about human drama and big philosophical ideas in a Bene Gesserit TV show, so I hope it's good. Um, Thanks for the super chat from Alex J. Brady. Is that the Alex J. Brady who did that art? I don't know. Um, Love the video and the channel. Uh, Consider covering A Canticle for Leibowitz, Roadside Picnic, Lord at Light, The Left Hand of Darkness. I would, I, I haven't read at The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin, but I would love to. I would love to cover some Ursula Le Guin at some point. I think, I mean, I think Quinn on Quinn's Ideas is covering some Ursula stuff soon, so go check that out. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Stuff, who says, have you watched Barry? Love it. I have not. Uh, thanks for the super chat from the Ninja Ghost Dog, who says, in the Elden Ring, when Godric, oh, you're the other guy. Yeah, well, um, look, you've never seen Alt Shift X and Vardy Vidya in the same room, right? There you go. Okay, um, I think we're going to finish it up. Uh, thank you so much for watching this live stream. Um, please like and subscribe. Uh, there are links in the description to the Alt Shift X podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Uh, I think this live stream will go on that podcast afterwards. I'm not going to clutter the Alt Shift X main channel with live stream VODs, but uh, we'll put it up on the podcast, I think. And um, yeah. Stuff says, please thank Alt Swift X if you see him. The Dune rap is a gift to humanity. I, I, I'm a bit worried that there's a pattern forming. Um, every time I make a big Alt Swift X video, this Alt Swift X lunatic goes and writes a rap about it. It used to be that Alt Swift X videos were really short, and Alt Swift X videos were really long. But now I'm dropping these really big Alt Swift X videos. And Alt Swift X is the succinct one. I don't... I'm disturbed by that pattern, and I shudder to think where I might go next. Anyway. Um, uh, so, yeah, everyone go and unsubscribe from Alt Swift X, lest he make more strange content. And, uh... <laughs> and, uh, yeah, have a good one. Have a good one. Um, cheers. Have a good one. Uh, more June stuff coming soon. But we're going to do... Uh, the philosophy of Dune will come out on Alt Shift X next month is the plan to talk about the themes of Dune. Uh, there's also a Jon Snow video coming out, uh, which is going to be similar to the real Tyrion Lannister video that we did. Uh, this is going to be a Jon Snow video, uh, that's going to be out at some point. And we're also going to cover House of the Dragon, the new Game of Thrones TV, uh, TV show, the prequel show. 
and comparing that to Fire and Blood. So it's going to be cool. All right. Uh, see you guys. And have a good one. Cheers.